As Commissioner, I am the public's voice in policing, and it is my job to hold the police to account. As I said in my public interview when Nicola was tragically found, whilst the police lead theory had sadly proven to be correct, and the search and investigation focused on the right strategy, there are also many areas of this case where Lancashire Constabulary represented the very best of policing. With the search and investigation being well resourced, professionally conducted and calling upon national good practice. It is often too easy to sweep past significant amounts of good work and exemplary conduct to get to the areas of learning in a review. Given the whole core of this operational response is praised by the review. But I want to start by saying we found the police investigation and search to have been well conducted by Lancashire Constabulary. We spoke to many officers and police staff and volunteers who worked on this investigation and their dedication and commitment was clear to see. They demonstrated the very best of policing. Their professionalism and operational activity was exemplary and while there's much to learn from this tragic incident, Lancashire Constabulary should be recognised for that. As part of the process, I asked the college to notify me immediately if they discovered anything that would amount to action needing to be taken against any officer or employee of the constabulary for misconduct or negligence of duty or anything that would have altered the outcome of the search and investigation or indicated that Nicola could definitely have been found sooner. There have been no such findings and therefore this review is very much a learning review. Well, I did find her in the river. And I said from day one that if Nicola was in the river, I would find her. And I, I'm, I still hold to that today. Um, if we had been allowed to dive and we had been allowed to search the area that we wanted to, on the day we arrived on Monday the 6th of February 2023, Nicola Bully would have been recovered, located and recovered that day back to her family without fail. So just to clarify, what, what day and date and time was your first target observed? The target we identified was Tuesday the 7th um, of February 2023. Um, I commenced my search at 10.28 that morning and six minutes later at 10.34 I located the target. Once you've made that discovery what's the first thing you do is it is that when you go and speak to the police yes and it was a phone call on that day i i made a phone call to the police and then i just sent the image the screenshot of the laptop mm. target was found um approximately 75 meters from the bench 75 meters 75 meters just down the river from the bench which again fits the pattern really how did the police feel about you, you coming into the search are they, were they welcoming and forthcoming in your assistance? I wouldn't say welcoming. I think they probably want, didn't want us there in the first place. I think in order for the organisation to be able to complete the search in a way that can be described as exemplary shows that the leadership of the organisation are doing something right in terms of having the right resources um, in the right place to do a good job. Were you 100% sure that's what it was? I was totally sure that that took human form straight away yeah. and it needed to be dived straight away right i because it was the shadows of two arms two legs whatever that, that needed to an immediate dive yeah and that's what we wanted to do when i contacted the police search advisor i said we need to put divers in now we'll put our divers in uh, but he refused that request and he said you're not to dive we will dive <laughs> So um, the area around the bench was searched three times, um, and the third time was in response, direct response to uh, the report of his suspicions. Um, we have shown as part of the review the images of um, uh, Peter Holding's images from that area at that time, and two independent uh, experts have said that it's unlikely and that that was uh, a body. So I don't think there's credibility to that claim. Unlikely, but you can't... But highly unlikely. 
Tinder report. Are there any other questions? I mean, uh, given, I, th I do think it's important to clarify this. The area was searched immediately after that report, and there was nothing there. I think that's really important. We have to deal with the facts here. Yeah, normally I'd be working with the police search advisor very closely and also the senior investigating officer, which I didn't obviously meet the senior investigating officer on this job. So you would normally get all the information, you know, cell site analysis from, you know, mobile phone data, you would get vulnerabilities, you'd get all other issues that come into it. And then a search plan will be put together. And I th me, may throw my piece in as well to yeah. say, actually, I think we need to look at this area. So that's, that's what we normally get. But with this one, we just got... We want you to search down river today. So I'd make a uh, mild correction, if I might, to your opening statement. So we're not highly critical. We uh, factually lay out the impact of that independent uh, dive expert in the search. And uh, his interactions with the media weren't coordinated with uh, contemporary media releases. And it certainly led to um, complications and challenges for the force. And I, 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 I've never felt it. I, I left that scene... And I was getting fed all sorts of information by members of the public and they were sending it to us at work. And normally you would pass that on to the police. I had no one to talk to. I had nobody to talk to in Lancashire because the senior investigating officer would never come down. She would never come to the scene. I never saw her. Is that normal? Day. No, not at all. You'd always get an SIO come down and introduce themselves. We, at the earliest stage of recognising uh, there were issues around the drawdown of expert advisors on a list held by the National Crime Agency. We escalated that concern to the head of the National Crime Agency who's undertaking a review. I understand that uh, that dive expert is no longer on the NCA um, list of expert advisors and I expect, as you'll see from the recommendations, other changes to make to take place to ensure that those incredibly useful on many occasions experts for investigations are available for policing but available under the right circumstances now now clearly where independent advisors are used we're of the view that they should um, sign a non-disclosure agreement which is legally binding and the way in which they're able or not to interact with the media in the best interest of everyone but particularly victims and family members and friends needs to be coordinated by police forces commissioning such services that's not a matter of uh, my independent review. We've made an observation of, of the facts and the audit trail of what happened. Uh, he is no longer on the list of the National Crime Agency's independent advisors. Because I, the police said to me it was nothing. And I'm, I, I felt pretty deflated, to be honest. And I'm thinking, it can't be nothing, but uh, they may be there right. And um, they must be right, because I you brought up to trust the police and I trusted their... The divers, because I've worked with police divers, you know, they're, they're good divers, and I've got no doubt about that. I thought, okay, well, if, if there's nothing there, there's nothing there, but what's creating the shadows? You see, that the bit I wanted to do was get in the water and have a look for ourselves. That was the key bit. And you weren't able to? No. The Independent Office of Police Conduct and the College have not found anything that warrants misconduct levels uh, within this review. Then I went back to the hotel that night, and I sat there, and I just... I was totally, told my wife, I was totally baffled what was going on here. So the following morning, I want, I asked the police to say, we want to go back and just recheck that area. That, but that was refused. You weren't allowed to go back? No, we weren't allowed to go back, no. The police were using their sonar. I, I now question the competency of that. That needs to be looked at at the National Search Centre mm. because... Are we actually conducting underwater search properly? Yeah. No, we're not. We may be with divers, but then clearly in this case, something's gone badly wrong. How can Nicola be missed by sonar, a dive team, underwater drones, ROVs? I'm not going to go down that route because they're not really effective in rivers, yeah. not murky water. But the divers with a jack stay search, what they call it, where you swim the line backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, near impossible struck off the national crime agency without any reason no reason whatsoever i didn't have a fair trial and there were, i actually done nothing but went up there to try and help people and i've been an expert on that database for over 20 years and i've done so much good work for this country when i say there was no sign of nicola i the the at that time i trusted the police 
with that that they had searched that and it's so it nothing. all boiled back to yeah. you relaying the target information I was, over, doesn't it? I was baffled. We did not get an opportunity to clear that. So I'm assuming I'm wrong. And it's only when I got up later on towards the inquest, when I started to prepare my files, thinking I just need to take these images out of my computer to yeah. start looking. And it's all time date stamped when I'm doing it. And it was crystal, crystal clear. And I could see a lane there. And that's when I started enhancing the images and looking at them. And I've that's when you started thinking, oh, no, I have, I have got, I have got this, something here. This, this is... And and then I didn't get invited to the inquest, and then I got very angry. Can someone who has been such a prominent figure in the search, mm. someone who's done a lot of media, someone who has, who will have a lot to say, mm. how can they not be invited well, to the inquest? Now that is what I find to be an insult to the I public. I think when you, it, it is an insult to the public. Well, when you look back, when we left the scene, we had no further contact with Lancashire Police whatsoever. So they didn't even request our search file. They didn't even ask for our sonar data. How strange is that? Nothing. I had a gut feeling that I wasn't going to be invited because I knew that once I spoke with my credentials at, and I would have brought that target up. I would have brought that target up and that would have thrown everything out the window. And I, I would have turned over PC Thackeray's evidence. I would have turned that over as well. To get stressed or mentally distressed, but it's been a lot of pressure for me because what there's nothing worse than having your name publicly disgraced as someone who's done nothing but good and i've got a hundred percent rec hit record for this for the work i do so that's that that is not pleasant but now i can come out and tell the truth and the truth is now out there good day everyone and welcome back to mind juice i hope this piece finds everyone well and embracing the spirit of the holiday season wow it feels grand to be back on the mic in amidst this wonderful community. Now, I do acknowledge that it has been some time since I last uploaded, and there are a variety of reasons for such. One to include my upcoming project, which as of late, I have been avidly preparing for and just to tease, is on the verge of releasing. I will briefly discuss this more later on towards the end of the episode. But as soon as this week hit, the release of all of this new information and further insight into the case, my focus and commitment immediately shifted back towards Nicola. I have a lot of things I want to cover here today. And given the extended time that I have had away, um, this did not perturb me from relentlessly reassessing this case day in and day out. And with that said, I have a lot of mind juice flowing, pent up. So. Although I may veer off point and or waffle for a moment, please bear with me and hold tight. After having had a few days to process and study the recent releases, I believe there is indeed key inferences that can be drawn, valuable insights to underscore, which together in unison for me, having spent the amount of time that I have on this case, has resulted in some pretty significant revelations in regard to the case as a whole potentially helping to fill in a few more of the pieces missing in this puzzle. I can't wait to share everything I have. By the time this episode is through, I believe this will mark one of my most substantial contributions to the case of Nicola Bully. Of course, I will get into all of the new and fresh releases, the long-awaited document, the independent extended re review, released this past Tuesday by the College of Policing. Then, of course, we have the accompanied press conference, which was about 13 minutes, featuring Chief Executive of the College of Policing, Mr. Marsh and Mr. Snowden. And then there's about a 30-minute Q&A that followed, which, which was quite entertaining. Simultaneously, that very day, to my pleasant surprise, completely separate and apart, a related interview was released, the day I found Nicola Bully by the channel Break the Ice, featuring SGI's Peter Falding himself, which, per the channel's permission, I did preview various snippets throughout the intro. And while I'm on this topic, I would like to commend the channel Break the Ice for a very well-produced, professionally held, and question interview. And furthermore, extend a huge thanks and appreciation towards Mr. Falding for partaking in such. To those of you whom have yet to watch the nearly hour-long full-length interview, 
I suggest that after this episode, you head on over to Break the Ice channel and watch it for yourself. It's well worth your time. Not only in regard to Nicholas' case, but further because it sheds light on initiating change and improvements towards missing person cases within the UK going forward, into the future. I will provide a direct link in the video's description. Also, I believe the channel is intending on future live engagements with Mr. Falding here coming up next month, but I'll have you visit there and gather those details for yourself if you're interested. Now, continuing on, first, I want to rewind and reflect back on the past two to three months to fill in and pick up where I left off with my latest piece, Are You Lost? From that point forward, there was hardly if any new developments and or news in updates relating to the case of Nicola. In fact, it was awfully quiet and scarce for a while there. That is, up until about a month ago. It was then, for and to me personally, I noticed things seemed to begin popping up here and there. Now, are such directly related? I cannot precisely say, but they're indeed interesting, and it's worthy to note considering that they began to enter the fold as the final review date drew closer. Briefly, a few of those I want to gloss over as we move along are as follows. There was the incident and tragic loss involving Iwalina Sasaka, I hope I pronounced that right, whom was a 30-year-old veterinarian, and apparently Willow's vet. In fact, one of the initial articles released on this case revealed this. Nicola Bully's name was in the exact title. However, it appears to have been completely scrubbed as I can't really locate it for the life of me. So if anyone has that, please send it my way. The UK and scrubbing media, what's the deal with that? Many conclude that Ewelina's fate was self-inflicted or elected, but without knowing more, I wouldn't think it's fair to just take the coroner expert's word, especially after what I have learned with Nicholas' case, and I mean that with all sincerity. But outright, on its face, merely having a professional relation vet service tied to Willow and Nicola is simply peculiar at best. I want to make that clear. I'm not alluding to any concrete connection here, but and it may not and likely does not have any direct correlation, but then again, you never know. I will not dive any deeper into that case here and now, but with that said, I do want to note the aura around that case is quite strange and very odd. She, Iwalina, did stress that she felt as though she was being followed by a gang of 10 plus people, feeling scared. She had a fear of being poisoned had she boarded a plane to return back home to Poland. Her family seems pretty distressed. Um, she ended up in a hotel away from her home area for safety reasons. Now, yes, of course, this could be a result of endless factors and reasons completely unrelated. Sure, but I do want to underscore those men in black seem to be a very real and serious entity, always in and around crime-related incidents, with apparent immunity from constabularies and coroners. Remember, there was a man in black sighted near the end of allotment lane the morning in time Nicholas supposedly went missing. Then here, last week we learned, there was another one, observing the recovery and SERP operations later on. Here. Take a listen, Peter Folding discusses his experience with one hovering around his team and work, appeared to be honing in on what we now know as the target location. I think it was, there was a guy in black walking around. The man in black, I've heard about this man in yeah, black. Yeah, and I was up there one day and this guy was asking questions of my team on day one. What can you find with the sonar, etc., etc.? And my team said, that guy is acting really weird. And I've got the pictures, you know, it was the, the man in black. And then I then... When we were in the river on the 7th, you know, once I located that target, we were going up river, and that guy appeared again, and he's there on his phone, he's looking, oh. and he's standing there. We're on the boat. Could you privately take a picture of that guy in black for me and just send it to me? Oh, really? Place? Yeah. So Dave got his camera of the long lens and done some perfect shots of him. I then passed that on to Lancashire Police. I never even got a reply. You never got a reply. I never. It was never followed. No one took a statement from me. Now, what we're looking at is a man who's been asking lots of questions the day before. Oh yeah. Very suspect. Tell, tell, 
And then again on the day two, he's mingling with the crowd and he's he's there and he's looking and he's watching everything. Why would you be there? He wasn't a member of the media. Now, this is the first huge revelation of many that I have for you here today. The man in black. Number one, because Peter expressed that he submitted such to the police, of which he received no reply. This man in black was asking very precise questions regarding sonar capabilities, as Peter's team was encroaching the target location. This is very significant. Remember, at that time, Peter and his team would have no reason to feel suspicious. Yet this man's behavior was still far enough outside the norm to trigger their intuition and radar that something may be off. So he forwarded it to the police and such would be their job to follow up upon. Unfortunately. Number two, Mr. Fife stated at inquest that he too had observed specifically a man in black whom he and I quote, thought was strange. Not to mention, there were also screams heard that morning as well. That makes two separate and apart sightings of a man in black who manifested strange and odd vibes by completely separate and independent people. Mr. Fife, Mr. Falding, present at absolutely crucial time points, first during the act of going missing and then upon location of a potential target. Yet, you have Becky didn't find it odd why two fishermen would have been there that day. However, the previous week and days, a local garage owner reported seeing two odd individuals in black, one appearing to cover their face, yet Becky, she found nothing odd and always insisted that her working hypothesis was the truth. She never even came down to the scene to introduce herself or actively engage. I really wonder how she became so stern on said hypothesis without direct interaction and engagement, actually spending time at the scene herself. Speaking of the covert SIO, brings me to my next area of interest and topic. It was, oh, about two and a half weeks ago now, I began receiving emails from a handful of you informing me of word that SIO Becky Smith had retired or resigned from her position, which supposedly was and is much earlier than her contracted tenure. Now, aside from one sole YouTuber I saw discuss it, I couldn't find anything regarding such. Not then or now. Not a single headline post nothing. If anyone has official validation or information of some sort to verify this, please send it my way. I'd love to take a look. So, two to three weeks ago, upon hearing this rumbling, understanding at that time that if true, Becky's direct significance, especially as it pertains to this case, would be big. The timing would be beyond alarming. Now, if she is in fact no longer an SIO with Lancashire Constabulary, really process that. Someone with 20 plus years experience and tenure, the lead SIO in Nicholas case. One in my opinion, who was selectively chosen given her covert, outside the eyes of the public, operative skill sets. However, she failed to prevail in this case. Complete botch. I'm not being mean. Look at the scrutiny that's been raised, right? With that said, if she is gone or left early, I would most certainly think that this would be associated with the unraveling of this case. Now, of course, you're not going to hear Marsh or Snowden publicize this openly. Maybe this was the learning trade-off Lancashire Constabulary had to make. I don't know. But it is a very interesting aspect. Remember, if she has any foul play here, she likely has so elsewhere over the previous 20 years. They wouldn't want to open themselves to that level or degree of scrutiny. I'd really like to know who was the one, her sergeant, whom, whom chose Becky specifically to be on Nicholas' case. There needs to be heat sent that direction as well, if you ask me, for if they merely let her go because she didn't cut it, the same type of operations will surely persist and continue in the future, just under someone else's name. The scariest part of this case? Sure, they were humiliated to a certain degree, but there's zero consequences. There's all a slap on the wrist. But they also learned a lot in regard to what not to do next time. I wish a reporter at the presser had inquired specifically about Becky, but then again, it likely would not have been answered because you hear at one point a reporter asks about Sergeant Riley's current status. 
of which Snowden completely dodges and doesn't even offer up a response to. I mean, he responds to the lady, but just regurgitates some useless rhetoric, which if you listen to him, I think eight out of ten times he doesn't answer the direct question. He just recites one of ten paragraphs he has memorized in his mind. He says the same things over and over. Hold the chief constable to account. The voice of the people. I think this is exemplary. It's over and over and over. He never really answers the direct questions. Listen to it yourself. Next, this small last brief thing I want to cover before getting into the big stuff. This past Wednesday, so the day after the College of Policing released the independent external review, Paul and Nicholas' residence apparently went up onto the market. Let's take a look at that. All right, so I'm not going to go all the way through this. Just some things I wanted to show. Um, this is the house, of course. Um, and the main thing is, is the timing, right? So you have Becky, the SIO, apparently stepping down two and a half, three weeks ago. And the day after all these releases, this house comes up for sale, right? And I'm not going to go all the way into it. Um, but I do want to show for purposes of this channel and the investigation, the areas that help show understanding into the timeline, right? So we know Paul will be upstairs in his office, okay? I'm not gonna go in the girls' rooms for their privacy. You can take a look at this if you'd like. So the stairs are right here, okay? So you come up the stairs, and then you have the office here. So this is the office where he was, you know, texting her. You can see Nicola and Paul, Paul in the photo there. Um, small office, okay? But this would be the office. Then go back downstairs here. It's a nice house, unique design. Um, we'll go over here to the kitchen. All right, so this will be the kitchen area, the island. You know, I would assume the girls, Nicola, down here making breakfast, right? So you go right through there where I just came from the steps. Um, so relatively close quarters. Um, then I'll show this here, the backyard, right? Um, but this is the garage here where they were parked and I'll show that, but it's interesting because they don't actually park their vehicles in here. I thought this was odd. Maybe that's something they do over there, but it's like a billiards room or shooting pool, right? This is the garage, which I thought was weird, but kind of a good use of space, I guess. And then that's kind of, I'm assuming that's Paul. So this here is the front of the house. The side over here where the vehicle was. Which they say in the IER document, you know, that images help prove that he was home all day. Why couldn't you just leave out the front, right? I mean, or the back. Isn't there cameras that way? This is a side, the other side here. Then this is, of course, the infamous area where there was a camera up here. The vehicle was parked right around here, right? Um, and I'm not going to go in on Emma and Paul really hard in this episode, but I do think there's some revelations that do fit into what I have figured out. Um, but mainly the timing of this is very odd, right? Um, and in my personal opinion, I've had that picture printed out and hanging up and look at it every day countless times. That is not Nicola in that photo. It's not. Like, it, it, and I'm not trying to be conspiratorial. That's not Nicola. Then you add in the fact that Nicola, the picture that is her, her nose is shaved off. The calf sizes are different, right? I'm not going to get all the way into that. But that's not Nicola in that photo. <laughs> I, I don't care what anybody says. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. Um... But yes, this going on the market the day after the external review, Becky being removed or retiring, what have you. And maybe she was given the option to resign or retire. Who knows, right? Now, allow me to transition on and over into the recent releases. And if you notice, my voice has changed. I planned on this episode coming out a couple days earlier, but I've come down pretty sick. So, um, yeah, my voice has changed a little bit. Um, but for those who watched the presser and the associated question and answer that followed, 
were elected to dive into the independent external review, which I'll refer to as IER, proves its contents, which is a rather comprehensive document and does cover a lot of information, albeit from the point of view of the police. I think it's clear to see and becomes very apparent early on there is a static tone and theme which is inevitable to continue throughout. That being that although there is indeed much learning to be obtained from the final review in regard to the handling, search and investigation into the Nicola Bully case, the lack of coordination, miscommunication, appropriate media channels were not in place, the control of the narrative, etc. They didn't do anything wrong, or as Snowden so eloquently puts it, it is often too easy to sweep past such significant amounts of good work and exemplary conduct to get to the areas of learning in this review. Aha, this dude. The simple fact he has to overemphasize how awesome they were and did over and over should tell and show anyone he's merely making sure he frosts the cupcake, so to speak, over and over. See, it's good. It is true, I must say. You see... What you get is a long list of excuses as to why and where the narrative was lost, for the truth is, everything was done exceptionally well. But see, the reason you don't believe or perceive such is because X, Y, and Z. The number one fixation of Snowden from day one has always been the narrative control. Always the control of the narrative. The review only attempts to reinforce this very idea, this loss of control, it was everyone else's fault, the media, the independent divers whom did not sign an NDA, they were focused on photo opportunities. They even go so far in the IER to say they wouldn't have had Falding or SGI dive, but they felt it would make them look bad to the media and public if they didn't let them help, so they allowed him to as if to try and spin it around on him, and it was Falding's fault he spoiled that opportunity. How dare he? Now we, the Lancashire Constabulary and Snowden, are left to pick up the pieces of this mess. Poor us, everybody. No, you mean try and still patch up the truth and reality he exploited? Discredit the one person who exhibited integrity throughout, and the only one who can be said to have maintained the best interest of Nicola Boli from day one? No one can take that away from him. All they had to do was allow him to dive that target location that second day he requested. It's easy. He maintained respect that first day. He allowed the police to dive it themselves, label it negative. But there is no rational explanation as to why he was refused from diving that second day. Not one, unless they were hiding something. I'm not being critical of police divers here. I'm standing for rational sense. He was not on the public or police's dime. Why was he not allowed to dive that area after the police cleared it as requested? Just because they claim it was negative and oh now they have these two scientists or experts come out and blah blah blah. Even here, the lack of confidence in Mr. Marsh's voice, they said it was unlikely. Unlikely? Oh, hi highly unlikely. It shouldn't even be an argument, but you can see it gets under his skin and it bothers him. Why? It all comes back to one simple question. Why was he not allowed to dive that area with his expertise wherein he deemed a strong target location? I'll bet the previous day when they let him go past the weir, had he requested to dive somewhere, they would have let him. It was that specific area, right? Mr. Marsh attempts to brandish his name Faldings in career this go around he got stitched up the first time but this time they really go at him I'll see to it authority follows through he's no longer on the list why because he asked to dive that second day wouldn't this be considered thorough work your police dove it three times what's the matter with a fourth I don't understand because he didn't accept and move on this doesn't call for reporting him. I mean, people, let's use some rational sense here. The fact they have elected to go so strong and hard against Falding to discredit him says everything you need to know. More on this later. Every single fault they have that doesn't 
make rational sense to someone with common sense critiquing them routinely is shifted and blame towards this was the biggest case in Lancashire constabulary history. They weren't quite re prepared to handle it. They uh, didn't have the appropriate personnel. The excuses are endless. Over and over again, you hear the chief executive, Mr. Marsh, and the crime and police commissioner, Snowden, tout. The search and investigation was well-resourced and professionally conducted. The Lancashire Constabulary exhibited appropriate, focused search and investigation strategy. The initial SIO working hypothesis sadly proved to be correct. They represented the very best of policing. No misconduct was found. Things that were in fact uncalled for are simply labeled as lawful. All mistakes are washed away and instead categorized as learning opportunities for the future. That's one of the most alarming aspects of this, their uniform overall lack of fault and accountability towards having done absolutely anything wrong. And such a robust rejection of those simply trying to help, whom wanted to be thorough and cross their T's and dot their I's. And to be honest, I was afraid this was going to be the way things played out with the review. The writing has always been on the wall. In fact, in my last piece, Are You Lost?, I highlighted the potentiality of there being a corrupt link up and into the College of Policing. Then I directly showed and discussed the Chief Executive Andy Marsh and Detective Inspector James Ansel at that time. Why did I do this then and warn everyone that the College of Policing may not be as straight and narrow as they should be in instances such as this, suggesting that they likely had some compromised interest aligned with the Lancashire Constabulary and all the weird stuff going on? If you rewind back to the early stages, back to when the Lancashire Constabulary submitted a self-referral in regard to the release of personal information and vulnerabilities, and that's what this is. They submitted a self-referral so everybody should just see that act as good ethics. No, it's, it's, it's just a play, right? The crime and police commissioner, Mr. Snowden, was already then preempting the College of Policing's review. Amidst a live investigation, the results had not yet come out, not been published, yet here he was publicly saying, I commissioned the College of Policing. Okay, good for you, dude. Now back off and let them do their job. Nope. He was already prematurely suggesting that there was no findings of misconduct by the police. Everything was lawful before the College of Police and even concluded their investigation and review. This was clear insight as to what was already clearly wrong. Yes, he is the voice of the people wanting to keep everyone informed, but how can he attest he is holding them to account if he's already preempting their successful outcome on an issue that on its face is very concerning? Right then and there, it was obvious the Lancashire Constabulary and Snowden had some sort of in with the College of Policing way back then. So then, to have this IER come out the way it has is simply more of the same song and fiddle. But everyone's ignorant, they'll eventually respect our authority, the audacity to come out and suggest that it was appropriately concluded, this case's handling was exemplary. Further, representative of the best of policing? Yikes. Even those supporting the Lancashire Constabulary, for whatever reason, have to have a hard time swallowing that. So let's get this straight. Generally speaking, the independent external review is designed and purposed to be a completely independent and external review process. That is, not influenced by any involved entities being assessed. Emphasis is supposed to prioritize transparency, ensure policing is held accountable. As a whole, the College of Policing is to be an institution projected to be, lead the people to believe, a governing body whom oversees the whole of policing across the UK that is charged with setting and maintaining the expectations and standards for the nation's best practices and conduct. Exemplary is defined as a desirable model. Regardless as to where you stand on this case, do you accept this conclusion as Chief Executive Marsh and Snowden suggest? An exemplary, desirable model and one exhibiting the best of policing? What am I missing here? They're really going all in on this. It's 
Bad enough they're deliberately covering up the incompetency, but to try and paint it as gold and sell it as such? It smells like snake oil sales to me. It's hard not to presume this actively in the present is not just another corrupt cancer throughout the hierarchy, much like that which was present within the Met not so long ago. Now, I am from the US, and I'm supposed to conclude this case, the truth, represents their best? Oh, no, the uh, the mishaps, those are all learning opportunities. See, see, it was the media that made it look this way, but in reality, they're the best of the best. All right, I still have a lot to get to, and sorry if I rant a little bit, but you hear in that presser after the IAR release, Mr. Marsh suggests in his summation that the release of the specific vulnerabilities and private information was a major issue with the case, which was determined to be lawful. However, as he stated, something that was deemed avoidable and necessary. This is the furthest they will go to accept any fault or wrongdoing. Yet, in the question and answer after the presser, you hear one reporter ask if they believed the release of such information was in fact an overcorrect on behalf of Lancashire Constabulary for having failed to appropriately categorize this as a critical incident or a high-risk missing person from the outset, which, in my opinion, I think the release of the vulnerabilities is twofold. Number one, they did fail to categorize this as a critical incident by national definition, which to be fair, is not learning, it is a clear failure, for such mishap could have been the difference between life and death in some instances. That right there could have legs for family lawsuit, just saying. So yes, they do this to cover their asses on that, failing to appropriately assess the initial emergency call. But also number two, which I think is the most important, and has been proven even more so as things have progressed, and it becomes clear with how grossly negligent they were with the degree of information they released. They didn't just say, you know, high risk in the vulnerabilities. They intentionally and deliberately went to the extent to go completely overboard, to really sell the nothing to see here, everyone. She's merely a menopausal woman with drinking issues. And I'm not meaning to be disrespectful. That's the headlines they used. To detour and divert media interest away from the case. The scrutiny was far too strong, and they knew they didn't want that, because things are not as they appear. They knew she wasn't still alive at that point. It tried to suggest, if you're out there, listen to this. It's simple. If they genuinely felt it had anything to do with her mental health, revealing such publicly would have only heightened the risk of the victim's mental stability, not provide comfort. Let's be real. Further, they were pitching it was an accident from day one. She fell in. It could have been an accident. And as we would see with the illegitimate inquest, in actuality, the vulnerabilities ended up having no relevance at all to any causation or association given the eventual autopsy findings. You hear them all throughout. The working hypothesis, sadly proven to be correct, it was an accident. So why did they say the vulnerabilities then? They leaked those vulnerabilities to cover their asses, number one, for incompetence at the early stages, and further, number two, to detour national and international interest on this case, because they knew this was not a typical missing persons case. And I think Folding's involvement underscores this absolutely, right? Why was he not allowed to die that second day? There, it's not about the police control. He respected everything they asked of him. There's not a rational explanation that can be given of why he couldn't die that day. Zero. Regardless, Chief Executive Marsh issues a slap on the wrist. No misconduct. Lawful. I mean, the way it sounds is, is you can do whatever you want as an officer over there because nothing's going to happen. Right? It was avoidable and unnecessary. They're trying to shove this aspect under the rug, okay? Yet, you have the crime and police commissioner over here still riding the Lancashire Constabulary Pine to this day. Just last Tuesday in the presser, he continues to suggest such was reasonably rationalized and well decided upon. Take a listen. You think then that that later disclosure about the personal details was just an overcorrection, a realization of all the should have gone down this road earlier? They did it too late, they did it in a clumsy way, there was too much information. What, what do you think they were trying to achieve at that point in the investigation by divulging what they did? 
So the review um, articulates that the decision was clearly rationalised and has a clear policing purpose. So the release of the information, hence being um, 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 shown as a lawful decision, was well rationalised with the right intent and with a clear policing purpose. However, arriving at that point, um, and that's the key learning from this report, arriving at that point where that rationalisation became apparent and where that clear policing purpose became needed, partly to safeguard the family and partly to um, regain control around what um, the, the vulnerabilities around Nicola were that led to her being high risk was avoidable. And I think that's the key point that the review highlights is that arriving at that position where it was a policing purpose, rationalised decision was entirely avoidable for the reasons that we've just uh, articulated during the build up in the investigation. So Voice of the People, the release by the Chief Executive College of Policing was deemed avoidable and unnecessary. Yet here you have the crime and police commissioner on the day of the final review being released state the decision was lawful well rationalized with right intent and served a clear policing purpose which he then goes on to state partially was to safeguard the family how the delivery of that information disclosed was a complete humiliation to her name in person how does that safeguard the family i'm curious and then he says and partly to regain control Regain control, Mr. Snowden? Exactly what I said previously. He reveals that here. The vulnerabilities were to regain control of the narrative. Nothing to see here, everyone. Merely a menopausal woman with drinking issues. Which we know that's not the case, right? But they want you to just move along. Clearly, in no way it safeguards the family. Think of how her two daughters will perceive these headlines when they grow up. Do you think they'll consider these comforting? The chief executive expressed avoidable and unnecessary. It doesn't mean a lick. It was a cheap-ass attempt to gain and appease the public. A pseudo-slap on the wrist, which loses all sincerity, if you ask me. As soon as Snowden, still to this day, asserts such was a well-rationalized, with the right intent, clear policing-purposed decision. Yeah, assisted their narrative, shift the scrutiny away, and turn the heat down. But it backfired once again there, brother. The voice of the people, all right. Now, moving on. I want to discuss the clear and apparent discrepancies between the Lancashire Constabulary and their opinion and perspective, what they try to promote as SGI and Falding's involvement with the case. You see, Lancashire Constabulary and Snowden, often speaking on their behalf, have always had a fixation on this idea of a narrative, pushing, almost forcing it, how they see fit, a very specific way. One of the biggest tells of this being present early on was their absolute unwillingness to be flexible at every single turn. In unison with their routine premature projection as to how things were and would eventually go. Not ever exhibiting or allowing change in stance, allowing evidence to come in, investigation to take a natural route. This everyone is indicative of a predetermined set narrative. I arrived at this perception on my own, observing their actions and words. Think Becky Smith, SIO. Nothing was suspicious to her, overselling how Nicola would hold her phone. Hell, the working hypothesis, she hit that baby dead ringer. I'll be damned. Wait a tick. Makes me wonder why she would retire before her swan song then. Shouldn't she be up for some Sherlock award or esteemed recognition? Huh. Seems like she has elected to take a step back, much more aligned with embarrassment, if you ask me. They try to paint SGI and Falding as being entirely out of line, they didn't obey direction, etc. In fact, in the Independent External Review, they even go so far as suggesting that they didn't necessarily want or need his assistance, but in lieu of the public eye, to appease the public, they allowed him in. Uh, really? Tell me your interest is not on your own image and narrative, how you look, without telling me your interest is not your own image and narrative. My lord, who do they have writing these things up? Maybe try, uh, we decided upon his involvement as we perceived he could have been some benefit, sharing the same interest, that being the search and recovery of Nicola. Why not try that once? Haha, <laughs> get a load of this, I can't, I can't even believe it. 
as if to try and suggest, had it been our call, he would have never been there. We allowed him in because the public interest is more important to us, or how things appear which, as they reveal, is not necessarily how and what they believe. They never had an intention to allow him to actually be involved. Their actions show that. It's easy. This is a slap-ass way of them being butthurt. What they're really saying and reveal here is that it would have been easier to control their narrative had he not been involved. Spending as much time on this case as I have, it has become natural for me to pick up on Lancashire Constabulary's dishonest style, shall I call it. It's not hard to pick up on once you're onto it. No, I cannot sit here and say or tell you I know exactly what the truth is and all of its various details. Of course not, but it's clear to see the running narrative they sell is not it. I'll briefly go over this attitude they project within the IER, as well as Falding's formal statement, which was released later in the day as a response to the final review being published. But first, to illustrate, making it simple, let's be objective here, alright? He, Mr. Falding, was directed to search the two to three miles past the weir the first day, which he obliged and did. Although, if it was his call, he would have preferred to search the hot zone, below the bench, right away. Why? Because it's the most logical, but he wasn't allowed that first day. On day number two, February 7th, after just six minutes, he identified a target location approximately 75 meters down from the bench. I'll show that here in the background too. I think this is a good estimate as to where that would be. At that point in time, he requested permission to dive but was denied. Told the NWSU and the police would take a further look themselves. He again obliged, even continuing on to use sonar in search so as to not tip off the media watching along the banks. He trusted the police and was doing his part to keep things private and confidential. They informed him later that the location was negative, nothing of significance was located. Then, as you hear Falding express, he was baffled. Still perplexed by this, given all of his experience, he still had a draw, something that would not allow him off of what he had observed believed to be a promising lead. So after respectfully moving out of the way, allowing them to handle things that first day, he requested permission again the following day. However, he was denied again. Now, here, it's as if the police suggest that he should have accepted the word no. How dare he challenge? You must trust our judgment and not inquire any further. Now, I'm going to use an example from the U.S. with Kylie Rodney, which is a girl who went missing after a party over in California two summers ago. And police dove that lake numerous times, okay, and they didn't find anything. Why? Because their equipment wasn't as um, high-tech, right? But they brought in this independent dive company, which I won't name because they've had separate and apart reputation problems. They brought them in and they located it right away. Dead ringer just like Falding did, okay? The police in that case were very cooperative, very thankful towards that separate independent diving firm, okay? So with that said, Peter's experience in the field, I 100% can see how and why he would want to be thorough here. Remember, everyone, this is about Nicola, not him versus Lancashire Constabulary. They want you to believe it's that way and they try to make it that way but that's not on him right this second denial to me not allowing him that second day after he allowed them to check it themselves represents one of the most telling aspects of this entire ordeal if you take anything away from this episode today to ponder or to further chew on i would prefer it be this what is the issue allowing him to be thorough the police supposedly dove that area three times, they claim. What's the matter with him diving at a fourth? Even at this point, then, he respected their, dis their direction, you know, he couldn't do it, and he wrapped up his search and returned home. If she had been in there, I would have found her. Why? Because he trusted the police, okay? You gotta acknowledge him being humble and admitting where he could have been wrong, right? because the Lancashire Constabulary refuses to do such. However, as inquest drew near, 
He began to gather his search file, enhancing the imagery, etc. He wanted to ensure his evidence and findings were at minimum raised and brought forth at the inquest. Not for his personal interest, but for truth and transparency. But he was never invited. This is where it becomes an issue much larger than respect and trust for their police. And clear, in my opinion, that something is and was not right. To make things worse... P.C. Thackeray, whom sat in at the inquest as the underwater dive expert, is an insider associate of Lancashire Constabulary, had no direct interaction during the investigation, yet is chosen to testify at the inquest under a pretense of being independent. Over and above, an actual independent diver and company who had direct interaction, identified a target location, he was refused to dive twice on two separate occasions, whom was ready and willing to show and provide his evidence, sonar imagery, live data, and furtherance of Nicola's truth. The fact that he was refused and replaced by somebody they paint as independent, who in actuality is not, should cast alarm bells loud and clear, a parade of major red flags. I chanted this way back then. You see, their fixation and absolute dire need to chokehold this narrative throughout can be demonstrated over and over. SGI and Falding being from an independent private entity, not on the in, didn't work. But they allow him in to allow the public to perceive they are being all in for Nicola. Yet it becomes clear as they progress, this is not the case. The experts and the academic professors cited in the IER whom are said to have reviewed the sonar imagery, were not given and opened up to the entirety of Falding's findings, the enhanced images, the live sonar data. Why? Wouldn't you want to ensure it was tested and screened thoroughly, in depth, before coming to a conclusion, Mr. Marsh? I could tell something was off all along, and to hear the interview Read the Lancashire Constabulary and the College of Policing's attempt to review and assess such has only validated that and what I felt all along. They're hiding something. They did not want him diving there for a reason. They did not want his honest evaluation and evidence presented at the inquest for a reason. They expected Falding to fall in line against his better judgment. And for this, I profoundly respect Mr. Falding's due diligence and the trust he has within his own intuition and experience. Why is such conviction his fault? Let him dive, show his evidence, be a part of the process. That is why he deployed his team to St. Michael's on River Wire, isn't it? Little did he know he was never going to be allowed to actually follow suit. Oh wait, Lancashire Constabulary, like I said, they did it just to appease the public. They never intended on having him or giving him a legitimate say. They underscore this themselves. It's not me drawing faulty conclusions. If the Lancashire Constabulary, Snowden, and Marsh genuinely believed their investigation was 100% authentic and the truth, that there was in fact nothing at that target location, number one, they would have allowed him to dive, and further, they wouldn't continue to go to these lengths to try and thrash him. Think about this. They are attempting to obliterate his name and career, his entire character, because they cannot refute his evidence and accounts. This is lying, cover-up, bullshit 101, everyone. What does this truly say? Authenticity of the policing process throughout here. Honestly, ask yourself that. And it gets worse. Most recently, while at the College of Policing, amidst the review process, a few months back, they presented and requested that he sign a non-disclosure agreement four times which he refused, thankfully. Ask yourself, why would and were they so adamant then, during the final process of the review, to get him to zip his lips if they felt and believed his evidence was not legitimate? If they felt it was all hocus, they would let it be. The public is smart enough to figure it out for themselves, right? The sick part is, had he done so, signed an NDA, That interview we just watched, the truth, would have never come out. Snowden and Marsh would have strong-armed their way through the finish line. This case has to be reopened and appropriately assessed. Anyone who has a loved one in a similar related instance would undoubtedly pray the lead search expert were this way, like Mr. Falding was. 
and or further that the policing agency would be welcome to such, like the case was with Kylie Rodney over in California. This whole thing should be about the victim, what she deserves, Nicola, honesty, truth, transparency. Not about which side of professionalism you fall on as the Lancashire Constabulary is trying to play here. They clearly have a vested interest that holds a much different line in narrative than is actuality and reality here. Exemplary and best of policing, my ass. Even the attempt to cover it up doesn't suffice. It's a joke. Here's a perfect example. In Snowden's six-minute spew that he gave in the presser after this final review was published, he indirectly confronts Falding's evidence by expressing it has been determined she could not have been found sooner. Again, if they were 100% confident and believed this, that the final review was an authentic, accurate depiction, why would he make it a point to say this? It's a subconscious revelation of, just in case, we have to make sure, we couldn't get him to sign an NDA, what if he shares what he has? Oh, I'll make sure and I'll say this bit. That's exactly what it is. The lengths they have gone to, the stitch up they are trying to sell, is appalling. They can't refute or confront the evidence. Unlikely, oh, highly unlikely, is not good enough. And showing the experts and academic folk the initial still absent the enhancements and live sonar data is a poor man's attempt to justify their stance. Once again, they reveal their true colors, which have been ever-present all along. Listen to Snowden here and I'll keep it moving. As part of the process, I asked the college to notify me immediately if they discovered anything that would amount to action needing to be taken against any officer or employee of the constabulary for misconduct or negligence of duty or anything that would have altered the outcome of the search and investigation or indicated that Nicola could definitely have been found sooner. There have been no such findings and therefore this review is very much a learning review. As he says there, anything that would have altered the outcome of the search and investigation or indicated that Nicola could have definitely been found sooner. Definitely? So there are things where she could have been found sooner. Huh? Now I'm not being too critical, but you gotta understand when they come up with these statements, they're very carefully worded, right? But chief case in point is why does he feel the need to slap that in at the end of his six minute thing? You know, to cast a doubt towards anything that may come up later, right? There have been no such findings. Now, I'm sure you can hear my voice is a little different. Again, I'm pretty sick and I have a cough drop in my mouth, so hopefully. That doesn't bother you too much, but I'm going to go over the Peter Falding aspect in the IER because um, I think it's important. You get a tone for how they slant him and his company, and then I'll go over his formal statement. And then I want to tie it up with what I've drawn from all this, okay, and how it applies to the whole story. Peter Falding. Mr. Falding is the founder and chief executive of SGI, with their website describing their services as a world leader in the field of specialist rescue, underwater search, forensic search, and protester removal. The actions of Mr. Falding during the investigation were raised with the review by the Lancashire Constabulary on several occasions. Seeing right there already, you can see that they're kind of planting this seed that there's an issue related to Falding, okay? At the time, so this here again is saying, he was on the crime agency list, but as we learn later, they highly tout he's not anymore because of his actions in this case, okay? His company was recommended to join the database in 2008, which is what, 15 years ago? These experts can be requested for listing on the database by law enforcement staff nationally to support investigations and provide specialist knowledge of forces if required. In this case, Lancashire Constabulary did not make a request. See, they're doing it again. They're, they're watering it down to use the services of SGI, nor was SGI recommended. So, double dose. Did not make a request, nor were they recommended by the NCA as a as support to the investigation. On February 3rd, prior to the, any attendance at the location of Nicholas' disappearance or contact with Lancashire Constabulary, Mr. Falding was interviewed by Sky News. He provided comment on aspects of the scene of Nicholas' disappearance specifically. It appears, and I'm not on the scene, 
that there isn't any marks where Nicola fell down into the river. So it's a bit odd. Well, yeah, it is a bit odd because they're claiming it's accidental and there's still nothing to prove or validate that stance whatsoever. You've seen in my last video, the police originally said she could have been taken. There were screams heard. There's a man in black. Peter also saw the man in black. Why is this a slant to him? I don't understand. On February 5th, Mr. Falding appeared again in the media where he referenced the ability of his team and equipment and the greater search and dive expertise provided in comparison with that used by police. He stated that he, he police equipment was low-tech, adding that it's very unlikely they would be able to find a body with it. See, they're trying to show that he's arrogant here. No, it's, it's true, okay? Just like I said with the case in the U.S. with Kylie Rodney. The police searched that lake over and over and over again. They had that specialist team come in who are phenomenal at what they do. And they find things left and right all the time because that's what they specialize in. Right? Um, and the police do not have the same, you know, ability with their with their stuff as, as Falding and his team does. Um, Nicholas' family became aware of this, and the efforts were made through Nicholas' family friend to contact SGI. So this would be Emma White to contact SGI and, and secure their services. Nicholas' family then contacted the investigation team and asked them, so that would be Paul, to involve Mr. Falding and SGI in the search for Nicholas, stressing the importance of following this lead and opportunity. Such a weird way to word it. Also on February 5th, Mr. Falding claimed that my belief is she's not in the river at all. Right, because he was told that it was negative and it wasn't till later, right? Um, as a deployment of a commercial dive team, okay, and commercial is something that makes revenue or bills for their services, right? Um, Peter Falding and the team came down volunteer free of charge, so I don't think it's fair to label them as a commercial dive team. It's kind of an insult. Outside normal practice, the SIO consulted with the National Search Elite and confirmed that the police search and dive team's capability, capacity, and equipment were suitable for the search. So, they must be able to provide some benefit, right? The National Search Elite advised that Falding and SGI did not have any greater equipment than could be secured through police channels. Right, but you weren't securing those through the police channels, right? And if you were to secure this type of equipment through police channels, you would bring in a company like SGI. The Lancashire lead was instructed to contact Mr. Falding to identify what could be offered by his company once apprised of what had been conducted to date. There followed communication by Nicholas' family friend, to the FLOs expressing a strong message that a refusal to use Mr. Falding and SGI that day would result in negative press release to the media. See, this is so ridiculous to me. They're trying to make this stance that they weren't going to use him, didn't want to use him, but because it would result in a negative press release, Lancashire Constabulary felt that this would undermine public trust and confidence and therefore subsequently agreed to allow the use of SGI to support them in their efforts. Tell me you don't care about your image and narrative without telling me you don't care about your image and narrative. They're basically telling you right here that the only reason they allowed Lancashire Constabulary in, like this is what they want you to believe. We wouldn't even allow him in. Now look what happened. Now we have to pick up all the pieces of his mess. Poor us. Are you, are you joking? This shows that he was never going to have a legitimate chance to have any say in the investigation. They were simply doing it for looks, right? And like I said earlier, I don't think that was the intent behind Peter Falding and his team. Mr. Falding offered his services free of charge to the family, right? So it's not fair to label him commercial, right? To ensure appropriate management of FGI and their associated dive and search activity by Lancashire Constabulary, an email was sent by the lead to Falding on February 5th. It stated, from Lancashire Constabulary to Falding, We agreed importance of utilizing your assets in conjunction with the ongoing search operation as such direction will come through the police search advisor. We also discussed and agreed that all operational information will be treated as confidential and that any operational information passed to the media will be done through the police channels. The requirement for this is to manage media releases to mitigate where possible undue distress to the family. The closing line of the email read, I cannot stress the need for discretion enough 
due to the massive news coverage this inquiry has and continues to attract. See, look how they're framing this. The closing line of the email read, I cannot stress enough. So anybody who reads this and be like, well, he did talk to the media. I can't believe he did that. See, this is this is ridiculous. Mr. Falling was referenced during the Gold Group meeting minutes in February on February 6th, where his activities required operational discussion and direction. On February 6th, an action was raised to ensure confidentiality agreement, code of conduct, and anonymity documentation were to be secured from him. During this gold group meeting, there was an update that SGI team had agreed that if they identify a find during their searches, they would not engage in a forensic recovery, given that the responsibility for this lies with the police trained specialist. Mr. Falding also agreed that any communications would only take place with Lancashire Constabulary to manage associated messaging to the family. The chief inspector was given the action to undertake a meeting with Mr. Falding to secure the necessary signing of a relevant documentation, and an action was raised to the next school group meeting the following day for this to be securely retained. It is recorded in the daily search strategy that SGI were deployed to assist the team on February 6th under the supervision and direction of the lead. On this date, Falding received an in-person briefing on the rules of his engagement. See, this is the way they say this, right? With the investigation in church, as well as the associated necessity for confidentiality. To support this, a confidentiality agreement, non-disclosure agreement, was drawn up with the assistance of the head of legal services for the Lancashire Constabulary. This incorporated the following agreement. And here's the deal. If this was true, they would have legal ability to make action, right? The fact that they're saying this is to create this ruse, you know, that he he's a reckless abandon, right? I, Peter Falding, and the SGI employees have been told this is so ridiculous. And I agree that under no circumstances will I discuss any aspect of this case with any person other than the investigation team. Twofold. If that was the case, understanding Peter Falding's character, the way you observed, the way it has been, do you think that he would go against it that hard? I don't. And number two, if this were true, they would have action against him. Why? Look what they did to Curtis Media. The second he did something, they lit him up. Okay, so they just try to create this whole ruse that he's this bad person. This document was provided to Mr. Falling by a chief inspector on the evening of February 6th, following his arrival at the scene. The chief inspector recalls, see, recalls, that means it didn't happen, that an explanation was provided to Falding that it was an NDA. See, no, no, no recalls and highlighted that he should not share any information with anyone. SGI provided a written response to the review team of their understanding of the NDA provided to him and stated, Peter did not sign an NDA either before or on the day he was asked to sign a piece of paper, which he was not provided a copy of. As we recall, it set out SGI's responsibilities insofar as risk assessment. This missive was not set out as an NDA, which that's normal, right? basically saying that I'm responsible if anything happens to me, I'm not the liability of the Lancashire Constabulary. That's a normal, typical thing that would take place, right? And that's what Peter's saying, that's all it was. And Lancashire Constabulary saying, well, it was an NDA and he misinterpreted it as that, right? The conf this confidentiality agreement contained no references to risk or health, which, why would you have an NDA but not assess the risk or health? As recalled by Mr. Falding. See, I'm not just trying to be on Mr. Falding's side. Okay, I'm honestly not. I'm trying to be objective and look at this straight through. But every single time, you can see the snakery on the Lancashire Constabulary's behalf. But instead contained a short paragraph providing indemnity for Lancashire Constabulary against any costs or claims associating from their involvement in the search. And I know people are going to jump me in the comments for not pronouncing that. Sorry, I'm just reading too fast. There were also eight points outlining the different information and confidentiality specifications required by the Lancashire Constabulary. It would appear that Mr. Falding was not provided with a copy, which seems to be an omission given the nature of the incident. Mr. Falding continued to engage with the media between February 6 and 8, providing his views and opinions on Nicola's disappearance. On the 6th of February, in the Times newspaper, Falding repeated a similar theory to one provided on the 5th of February, claiming that he would be able to find Nicola within three days if she was in the river. And he did. In the Gold Group meeting on the 7th of February, an action was raised for the Chief Inspector Silver meeting to meet with Falding to offer suitable, robust advice about the information he is passing to the media, unhelpful to the investigation, the family, and the wider community. The action was undertaken and discharged. And Mr. Falding says in his statement, he does not recall this happening. 
And why would he lie? On February 8th, because if he did, and this happened, they would have action against him. But they don't. On February 8th, an action was raised for a holding press statement to be devised to counter any misleading or false statements made by Mr. Falling within the media, and this was to be reviewed by a gold commander. On February 9th, there was a discussion about Mr. Falling where a further action was raised regarding his activities in relation to his engagement with the family. He had also requested a photo opportunity to take place at the scene. So, like, why are they adding this in here? This is so stupid. Like, even if he did, who gives a shit? Okay? But he didn't. But the fact that they're trying to add this in there, well, look what else he did. Look what else he did. <sighs> Jesus. He had also requested a photo opportunity to take place at the scene with a member of the chief officer, the family, and himself, which was declined through the gold group meeting. <laughs> so ridiculous. It was clear from the recording of these meetings that some of the behavior and activities demonstrated by Mr. Falling caused challenges in the investigation. Yeah, because your guys is hokey. Oh, man. The review team asked SGI to explain why Mr. Falding sought to engage the media and discuss the investigation. I don't think he was going out and raising his hand, okay? The area was not cordoned off. I have tons of pictures that show that. There was no police presence really that first day whatsoever, whether they were done or not, whatever. But there was no coordination whatsoever by the police, okay? That's not his fault. If I was a reporter or I was there for Mind Juice, I would run down to the guy in the yellow coat getting out of a boat too. Like, let, let's be real here. Given the direction in the NDA that the investigation case is not to be discussed, well, there is no NDA. This is, see, the thing is, they know he didn't sign an NDA or they'd have action on him. The fact that they're trying to sweep past and suggest that he signed an NDA shows they're intentionally leading you the wrong way. SGI responded that there was no official NDA discussed or signed for. The police failed to engage with SGI about any press statements. Peter and the team were ambushed by the press and had no support from the police or any feedback after making media statements, and therefore he assumed his press engagements were within the terms of engagement. And what did he really say that was that bad to the police? He was always respectful to the police. And as we find out now, he continued searching with Sonar to not tip off the media, right? Like, he trusted them that his sonar was a negative, even though they wouldn't let him die the second time, right? Like, how much more civil could he be? Like, I, I, like seriously. In addition to his continued media presence, Lancashire Constabulary present, and all of this is coming up because he went in, enhanced the images, and used the live sonar data, and I'll be darned, that's Nicola. That's why all of this is coming out. Had he not done that or had any interest in doing that, none of this would even exist right in addition to his insane reason um snowden said that in the thing too in addition to his continued media presence lancashire constabulary presented examples of when mr falling operated outside the terms of engagement with the search direction this included an incident on february 8th when he was observed digging with a spade in a woodland near the river this search activity had not been sanctioned by the lead and mr falling had not undertaken any forensic precautions okay where he is a forensic expert so land and water i'm not saying that he had the right to do it but to assert that he didn't take forensic precautions i would like to hear his take on that i highly doubt he's all willy-nilly over there throwing a spade in the ground as they make it seem to ensure the safe recovery well will you oh. i have the recovery video still saved and i've been watching that frame for frame and i don't think you guys did a very good job at all whatsoever in fact there's a couple comments that i'll make but i'll save it because it's probably not best that i share those publicly those who know know exactly what i'm talking about so better be careful saying stuff like that this activity fell outside the agreed terms of the engagement where any forensic recovery should not be undertaken when challenged at the time by the police, Mr. Falling stated that he believed this to be an area of recently disturbed earth indicating possible deposition site. This location had previously been searched and eliminated as part of the initial police search response on January 27th. Following this assertion, it was reassessed by the lead, who comprehensively documented why they considered the area had not been recently disturbed. Mr. Falding had also informed the family that he thought he identified a body deposition site the location or believed location site of a deceased body as part of this review lancashire constabulary suggested that this had caused unwarranted distress and false alarms so this is important mr falding had also informed the family that he thought he had identified a body site 
was this him, him when he's in that picture with Paul pointing down to that area that he got a target location there? Is that what that was? When he's standing at the river's edge with Emma and Paul? Because that's my first interpretation. As part of this review, Lancashire Constabulary suggested that this had caused unwarranted distress and false alarm. Lancashire Constabulary also stated that the activity of Mr. Falden resulted in the diversion of police resources to family to remedy the situation. It is the view of the Lancashire Constabulary, well, or to go back and figure out what your next step was going to be, a la the 15th Marsh Farm Hall interviews, because that's what happened. Like Paul says, I feel like I'm in an episode of The Truman Show. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. All part of the process. It is the view of Lancashire Constabulary that Mr. Falding had a significant impact on the investigation, and rightfully so, to be honest, and public confidence through his activities and engagement with the media. The review team considers that some of his actions create a more challenging environment for the investigation team. I, I know I'm going off on a rant. Some people are getting upset and probably stopping to watch, okay? But I would like to see one part of this investigation from step one one example to where they did exemplary work every single presser was a bomb riley lawson smith snowden marsh every single one of them bit dust every single one of them his public statements often contradicted the investigative and operational approach, leading to confusion for the public and reducing the family's trust in the investigation to serve search operation. Within the media, there was a bunch of articles. I'm not going to read that. Some social media commenters referred to his comment as evidence for the alternative explanations for Nicholas' disappearance. Mr. Falding made several statements to the media that were later found at odds with the inquest findings. The inquest is a hoax. The coroner took a bunch of inconclusive findings and claimed them to be a conclusion. That's not how it goes. That's not how it works. They weren't even able to determine anything. I mean, all the experts they had up there, not I don't even think any of them were legit. The Fitbit was questionable. I mean, come on. My belief she is not in the river at all. My opinion is, had Nicola gone in by that bench, she would have gone to the bottom and drifted a couple of meters, which she did. If Nicola's in there, we will find her. If she's there, our sonar will pick her up straight away. And it did. Sadly, the discovery was not found in the river, but in the reeds at the side of the river, which was not part of our remit, as the side sand sonar did not penetrate above or below the water. And see, that was the whole narrative they tried to slash him for way back in March and April, right? So they were already trying to discredit him at that point. And what we know now, because he found a target location, we didn't know that at that point, but they were already starting to knock him down then, right? And here I am defending them all the way along, not having any clue that all that stuff, like that's like to me, it's like, man, I trust my judgment on it because it surprises me, but it really doesn't, you know? Like at the end of the day, it's, you can tell who's being straight and who's not, right? Inquest findings show that Nicola was found in the river. She was found some distance from where she fell in. She was not found by sonar equipment and she was not found in the reeds. And she wasn't found by the police either. And I think there's a very specific reason. And Jason has shared that privately, probably shouldn't have. Lancashire Constabulary also shared concerns with the review that Mr. Falding had behaved insensitively towards the family at an extraordinarily diff difficult time. It was assessed by Lancashire Constabulary that he used his conversation with the family to provide quotes to the media. Like, this is ridiculous. Really? Does anybody believe? Like, come on. I can't believe that they actually think that people are going to believe this stuff. Uh, to provide quotes to the media. And I'm not just saying this because I, I'm all pro-Falding here. Listen to every one of their pressers. None of them are genuine. Not a single one of them. That's why I have this stance. Mr. Falding provided information to the review. Okay, this is big. Information to the review. His view is that he had no official information in his possession to disclose to the media. He explained that he provided press statements and interviews because he was hounded by the media, which, I mean, yeah. It was his view that there was no control over the media or, or official press area. Watch some of those early videos. Chris's. There wasn't. There was like 15, 20 media people all over the banks and like two police officers 
walking next to each other talking, not really looking at anything. And this differed to other police operations he had previously been involved with. He stated that he was not advised or supported with any media guidance by Lancashire Constabulary, that he did not receive any instruction not to engage with the media, and that he would have stopped had he been directed to. During their review, Mr. Falling disclosed what he considered to be a credible find during a search conducted on the 7th of February. He presented sonar images of this find to the review team. He went on to explain that he had brought this credible find to the attention of the lead on the 7th and following a dive by the NW or whatever, it was found to be nothing when they said negative. This caused great concern for Mr. Falding, who strongly asserted the Lancashire Constabulary lacked professional interest in this find, which I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, right? Like I said with the U.S. case, you know, why are they so butthurt that someone's coming in and saying, hey, I might have found something, right? This shows right here, lack professional, the fact that they're saying this shows that they can't take somebody on the outside giving them advice that's actually correct, right? This is condescending. Documentation was recorded daily for the search activities by the lead and was reviewed on the 7th of February to identify this find and its outcome. The record documents that on this date, the national search lead was also in attendance at the scene and briefed the lead. SGI were tasked to search the hot zone, the area around the bench, for the entire day. It is recorded that during the survey, Mr. Falding and SGI identified one item on the riverbed, which couldn't be ruled out, so police divers dove and cleared the item. See, and they're presenting this in here, okay, to say that this is likely what the other thing was, right? That's why they're throwing this in here. Why didn't they do the same thing, right? Why didn't they bring the tree branches up? I don't understand why they, I don't understand. On February 8th, Mr. Falding stated that their three-day involvement ended after a thorough extensive search of the areas where tasked with Lancashire police is found and no sign of nickel. The dive team was later contacted by the interview team regarding this find and was also confirmed a dive had taken place on the 7th of February following the sonar imagery presented by Mr. Falding and SGI. The dive team worked from the GPS coordinates provided by the team along with a marker that they had placed on the riverbank. This location was close to the bench where Nicola had left her phone in some distance from where she was found. The diver who undertook this dive was able to confirm that the dive took place at 1321 and the find was found to be tree branches underwater and therefore cleared as negative. Why didn't they bring those up? Or why can't they reveal those pictures? Why aren't, why aren't those in here? Right? Why aren't they in here? Now, I understand why Falden can't release his. I get it. It is relevant to add that this same area had previously been searched two other times. Use building sonar equipment and dive methods. They had also proved negative. The diver stated, I am actually 100% sure that there was no body in that part of the water at that time. It is not very often they dive in such an unobstructed body of water with such a flat bottom and with visibility. The diver provided their own record of this dive to the review team. The coordinates of the images, what they record, of the dive match exactly those of SGI's images. Okay, the stills. What about the enhancements that were made in the live sonar data? This diver also provided the primary dive evidence to the coroner at the inquest into Nicola's death. Right, and that's only one side. Okay, someone again who's not independent. To supplement this and to provide an independent view, which is not independent, this is such a lie. Contact the leading government, so government, okay, is not independent. <laughs> Sonar, I mean, I mean, you're part of the Lancashire Constabulary, which is a militia police unit. Independent contacted a leading government sonar specialist for their opinion of the sonar images taken by SGI. They provided the expert view that they had low confidence. Well, at least there's some confidence that the images were that of a human casualty. Mr. Falding later contacted the review team on October 26th, so this was not long ago, right? and provided further images of this find. To provide additional expert and an independent opinion, these and the earlier sonar images were assessed by lecture from this university. The target cannot be positively identified as a human body based on the data presented. In my opinion, this target would be classed as a low probability of confidence for human remains. I would recommend the target be inspected by divers on a robotic camera system following high priority targets in the dive area. This review concludes that this find was sufficiently investigated by the search team and that at the time it was established to be a negative finding. This was additionally supported by the expert opinion of the images from two independent scientists which were received during this review.
The management of Mr. Fallon's activities at the scene and his interactions with the media while discussed at the Gold Group level of concern for Lancashire Constabulary was not incorporated into a media strategy. Lancashire Constabulary attempted to implement measures to ensure Fallon's compliance with operant activities. Further engagement intervention may have been helpful. Constabulary should have considered providing an official force media tent or area either at or near the scene resourced by the force's communications team. This would have supported the force's engagement with the media and external voices. If a force engages an expert, even not procured directly, any NDA you should clearly set out the parameters within which the expert is expected to work, as well as the likely consequences if these requirements are not met. A copy of the NDA should be provided to the expert, which this shows right here they didn't give him an NDA. All right, now this is a formal statement released later that day after the IER by Mr. Falding. SGI, on behalf of well, Mr. Falding, in relation to the College of Policing Review of Lancashire Constabulary into the Nick, this appearance of Nicola Bully. I'd like to begin with saying that my thoughts remain with the family and friends of Nicola Bully at this very difficult time. The statement has been made in response to the release of the College of Policing Review of Lancashire Constabulary into the disappearance of Nicola Bully. The reasons for this statement are to reveal the full truth about my search, answering some of the vital outstanding questions in this case, and protect and rebuild an excellent professional reputation that underpins who I am as a person in my highly regarded company, SGI. And they just gotta hate that he does this. And man, all the respect, because... I mean, he has every right. You know what I mean? He's just standing behind what he observed and what he believes the truth is. The problem is he's just not being allowed to be heard, right? You even heard the Lancashire Constabulary say he was merely allowed to dive to appease the public, okay? He was never going to be allowed to actually officially do anything, which I've told you the whole time they had a fixed narrative and it was always going to be stuck to. The problem that Falding comes in as a lion and is willing to stand behind what he finds, they don't even respond to it. You know what I mean? Experience. I have successfully been conducting forensic search operations, locating human remains and evidence on land and underwater since 1999. 24 years. At that time, I pioneered the use, pioneered, okay? The use of side sand sconar in the UK to search for missing persons and evidence underwater. I work closely with the police national police search advisor, Professor Mark Harrison, MBE, and carried out extensive trials with equipment brought in from the United States, and as a result, in 2001, became a registered expert on the National Crime Agency database. Since then, I have been brought in by police forces across the UK to assist on some of the most high-profile cases. I have advised the UK and international police forces, including the FBI in Quantico, Virginia, and have been a guest of the U.S. Secret Service in D.C. I mean, to be a guest of the U.S. Secret Service says something. And I'm not just saying that comes I'm from the U.S. It, it says something. My work is highly referenced. I'm a leader of the field in underwater forensic search and recovery across the UK and the specialist group SGI underwater dive team and have been the official dive team for police forces in Surrey, Sussex, Thames Valley, Kent, Essex, and Hampshire and have located and recovered items of evidence and the bodies of many missing persons over the years, bringing cheap relief, dignity, and closure to their devastated families. The SGI underwater search team have proven competence levels are fully vetted, insured, and approval by the health and safety executive. The team have undertaken highly confidential sensitive work for many years for government bodies including the HMRC and police forces across the UK. As SGI is well known and highly regarded with an established success rate, the majority of search work the SGI undertakes is procured directly via independent county police forces and other agencies and not through the National Crime Agency. My team and I pride ourselves by always acting with honesty, integrity, dignity, and professionalism in all aspects of our work, especially when assisting the police and families who have lost loved ones. As a person on the outside looking in, I would say that this is exactly what you exhibited. 100%. Monday the 6th, the first day, February 2023. The SGI underwater search team and I arrived in St. Michael's on wire to assist in the search for Nicola Bully. The river had already been searched for many days by police divers from the NWU search unit and using their side sand sonar with no sign of Nicola. We were initially tasked by Lancashire police to search the tidal section of the river wire from the weir down to Cartford Bridge, three and a half miles down river. The area was searched thoroughly using 1800 hertz side scan sonar. 
No significant targets or any sign of Nicola were found. Second day, Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, we were tasked to search the non-tidal section of the river wire above the weir in an area I would class as the hot zone. This is the area in front of the bench down to the weir. For ex From experience, if Nicola had entered the water here, this is the area where she would most likely be found. My team and I commenced the search at 10.28 a.m., and six minutes later, at 10.34 a.m., I identified a significant target that appeared from my experience to take human form. This target was approximately 75 meters downstream from the bench just south of the island in the river. At 10.53 a.m., I notified the Lancashire Police Search Advisor of my findings by telephone. I also sent an image of the target on WhatsApp and requested that we put our SGI divers in the water immediately to check the area. My request to dive the target was refused, and I was told that NWUSU would conduct the dive that afternoon. Later, that team advised us that the target was found to be nothing. This baffled me deeply, as I am not usually wrong when I locate a target, especially a body that shows a clear signature. Sonar shadows cannot be created by nothing. At 16.30 that day, we discreetly rescanned the same area, which showed the same target in the same location. I love that. Discreetly. They went back after the police left. That's funny. I mean, that's just, that's awesome. That's just great follow through. Having worked closely with police and police dive teams for many years, I had nothing but respect for them and instinctive trust in their ability and had no reason to doubt their findings. Although I thought I had found a very credible target, I conceded that maybe I was wrong and later that afternoon I made a statement to the media saying that there was no sign of Nicola and that I did not think she was in the river. At this point I had searched many miles of the river and the only target that I located was deemed to be negative by police divers. Wednesday, November 8th. The following morning, I made a request to the Lancashire Police Search Advisor that we rescan the same area that the target was located. My request was refused being told once again that the target area was clear. See, that I do not understand what the issue is. Having thoroughly searched the parts of the river that were tasked with and with no other targets found, I made the decision to leave the search. After leaving the scene, I had no further contact with Lancashire Constabulary. Unusually, they made no requests for our search records or sonar data. Well, yeah, it's because they tell you in their review, you were just there to appease the public. Leading up to the inquest and the revelation, in preparation for the inquest, which I assumed I would be invited to, I revisited and analyzed and enhanced every sonar file recorded during my two-day search, and particularly from February 7th. It became clear when enhancing the images with the sonar software tools, and I know how this stuff works, not specifically underwater, but I have special software for images, and you'll see in my future work that I have extensive experience in this area, so I know exactly what he's talking about, okay? Um and what you can really draw out from things using these type of tools they're very powerful right but you got to have an eye for it and it takes a lot of experience um, but once you're good at it you can't just show it to somebody you have to kind of you know show them and then once they see it you can't unsee it but for some amateur eyes to like look like it's 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 hard to explain but reading this i 100 percent understand what he's describing here became clear when enhancing the images with the sonar software tools that the target which I had located was without a doubt Nicola. Without a doubt Nicola. I mean, this is very strong for him to come out and say this, right? I mean, he has a huge reputation, big company. I mean, guest of the Secret Service, work with the FBI. I mean, he's been doing this a long time. <laughs> I had in fact found Nicola at 10.34 a.m. on the 7th of February after just six minutes of searching. The enhanced sonar file taken at 16.30 on the 7th of February clearly shows Nicola lying in a fetal position on her right side, legs bent. This is huge. He's saying right side, which means that her back is towards the center and her legs and arms are facing the bank, okay? So his imagery, this is the first time we're getting specific indication that it's right side. So clearly the enhancement had done something, right? So when Snowden says that we definitely, she definitely couldn't have been recovered sooner, were these taken into account, right? Nicola's body lying in a fetal position on her right side, legs bent. And I know this is graphic. I apologize in it warned before I started reading. Um, I would have presented my findings and evidence at the coroner's inquest. However, I was not invited to it. My next opportunity would be to present the findings at the College of Policing review team. Tuesday, 
September 5th, I was asked to attend the College of Policing Review meeting where I was asked a total of four times to sign an NDA, which I refused. This is insane. This is absolutely insane. Why are they asking him September 5th four times to zip his lips? Because of the evidence he has. Because you can see Nicola lying on her right side in a fetal position, legs bent. And if they're going to acknowledge that, they have to acknowledge they completely botched this whole thing. Why do you think Becky Smith retired? Although I had no intention of releasing any information before the report was published, I did not want to put myself in a position where I would be unable to publicly tell the facts of the search in the future or disclose to the coroner if requested. The many questions for me primarily covered my engagement with the media and did not ask about the details of my search operation at all. So while he's at the College of Policing, they're asking him about media engagement, which if you go back to what we were just covering, that's what they're trashing him for, right? He didn't sign it. He, he should have went through the channels of the police, blah, 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 blah. They don't want to talk about this, right? They're, and that's the most powerful stuff. This is why he wasn't allowed an inquest. However, I used this as an opportunity to reveal my findings and showed the officers the first image of the target, showing the symmetrical shadows taken at 1034 on the 7th, and briefly showed the supporting live sonar data. However, the meeting had to be cut short due to meeting room only being booked for two hours. I advised them verbally and subsequently in writing that more information, including viewing live sonar data, can be arranged. Why, why wasn't that allowed? Nicola's truth, potential truth, let's say that, doesn't matter because it didn't fit in the two-hour book time and all they wanted to talk about was media engagement because that's what made them look bad. See, what's the Lancashire Constabulary's interest? Over and over again, it's not hard to pull it out. At the same time, His Majesty's coroner, Dr. James Aidley, was sent a copy of the same information with the cover letter by recorded delivery showing the sonar targets and offering to meet him in person to show that data. I have never received an acknowledgement or reply from him. I mean, come on. I, I don't... <sighs> Writing on the wall. After the College of Policing interview, following the College of Policing interview, no request was made to view the live sonar data or discuss my findings in more detail. Concerned that no further information request was made, on the 27th of October, I sent a second detailed letter to the College of Policing offering more information. See, he didn't come out at all. He's holding all this in, okay, while the process is going on. So when Snowden comes out and says that, you know, because they're anticipating this coming out. Little did they know it'd come out the same day as a third-party YouTube. Gosh, I bet they did not like that. The letter included the exact location of the target marked with the latitude and longitude on Google Maps and further enhanced clear image of Nicholas' body. Because the thing is, is now they're having dive experts say that I've never seen a riverbed so clear. It was just tree branches. For them to acknowledge that that's Nicola, they're going to have to turn to four or five people and say, you knew it was her, why was nothing done? And they can't allow that, right? I'll get into that here in a little bit. Clear images of Nicola's body lying on her right side. And again, that's so big. The fact that he can distinguish which direction the legs and arms are facing, right? To determine she's lying on her right side in a fetal position, legs bent. The length of the body parts accurately measures to a person approximately 1.61 meters, the same height as Nicola. I explained that although these images are clear enough to see, the live sonar data offers the clearest view and provides the ability to measure the target and confirm the exact size. The offer to provide and explain the sonar data was made once again. I also strongly implored the review team to sensitively disclose my findings to the family as this will be very distressing for them. And see, the thing is, I'll get into this in a little bit. You would think that Paul and, I guess I'm saying Emma... The family, okay, would be wanting this to be fleshed out a little bit more. Asking questions, let me see the photos, giving a statement, not letting Lancashire Constabulary tie a nice red bow over it. It doesn't surprise me because, again, they've been hand in toe the whole way. I received a response from the College of Policing on the 2nd of November, earlier this month. 
stating the review team checked with the search team at Lancashire Constabulary. They acknowledged that they had received this information from you and undertook a search in the area of the sonar images. They found nothing there. The review team also sought advice from government and academic experts. I mean, an academic expert, like, I respect the heck out of academic experts. I study a lot of um, psychiatry stuff from Harvard, Stanford. Like, I, I love that stuff, okay? But there's a difference between an academic expert and somebody who's been reading sonar going underwater for 20 plus years, okay? Um, and that's no disrespect to the academic experts. I think they would even say that as well, okay? Book knowledge does not equate to sonar reading ability, right? I wouldn't even be able to accurately read sonar appropriately. Why? Because I'm not skilled in that department. Their views are articulated in different ways, and the conclusion of all those views is that the images you provided are of low certainty to be a human body. Page 105 of the report reveals that the government sonar specialist was only shown the initial image provided to the review team taken at 1034, which is big because it's before enhanced and not in any of the enhanced images. Page 106 of the report reveals, see, they're intentionally avoiding the crucial knowledge that Peter Folding was cut off from because they only booked the meeting room for two hours. See, now they're starting to cut it off. If you don't know, it don't hurt you. Page 106 of the report reveals that it was only after I provided further images and expressed my concerns that a thorough investigation was not being done that an opinion was sought from her lecturer at Cranfield University who states the target cannot be positively identified as a human body based on the data presented. Considering the very high profile nature of this case, I'm surprised that I was not asked to discuss the images with the academic experts or, yeah, or take them through my irrefutable sonar data. To confirm a sonar, ta sonar target, the live data must be viewed using the sonar software that the data was recorded on. Oh man, I love this guy. Software can provide the following. Time and date stamp, length of a target, height of target measuring the shadows, the exact position in longitude and latitude. The target can also be enhanced by using a range of color palettes, and that's what I have experience in. Shadow reversal in raw data. Simply looking at PDF images is not enough to come to a conclusion, similar to a hospital sonographer viewing an ultrasound. I would ask how much practical experience these experts have in using high frequency sonar for forensic research and locating human remains underwater and what criteria they use to assess the images and make their conclusions. And that's what I was saying, like academic experts, okay, but it's like asking a brain surgeon to fly a plane. Like, what, what do you, hey, I get it. They're both like, what, what? Lecture could not confirm or deny the target with the limited information provided. I remain certain this target is Nicola and would welcome the opportunity to discuss my findings with these experts as soon as possible. The police dive team confirmed to the review team that they found nothing when investigating target. However, page 105 of the report states they found only tree branches underwater. This is an obvious discrepancy from the original nothing narrative, which yes it is, that's a great point. And after 25 years of underwater search using the sonar, I know the difference between what tree branches and human bodies look like. I would be interested to compare their sonar data with mine, as report says their images and coordinates match exactly, yet neither expert opinion above considered the image to be tree branches. That's such a great point. Like, listen to this. I mean, he makes a great point. And it's not like, oh, like that, that's a very valid point that should be addressed. You go, Falding. What a legend. How did Nicola end up in her final resting place? Closer to the date when Nicola was found, decomposition gases inside her body built up enough to float her to the surface. Probably under the cover of winter darkness, Nicola would have floated down the river and over the weir and into the tidal section of the river where eventually she was deposited in her final resting place on a rising or falling tide. My theory is supported on page 31 to 32 of the report by independent expert. From the title information and the predictions by experts, it was anticipated that the weekend... 18th and 19th February might become as significant in the search to find Nicola. Resources and tactics were planned for a large-scale search on the afternoon of 19th of February as the tide ebbed. Sunday, February 19th was also the first high tide since Nicola's disappearance, with 20 cubic meters of water per second moving over the weir. This predicted tidal movement would likely contribute to a floating body on the surface moving with the tide. The challenges of searching in water prevented Nicola from being rapidly located and recovered. When Nicola was finally recovered, she had been caught by underwater branches of a tree while being transported back out by the recorded ebbing tide. There were no reeds in that section of the river. Release of the images and live sonar data. 
For ethical reasons and out of respect for the family, I will not releasing any of my images or live sonar data to members of the public, which, which sucks because I would love to see those and I would never share them. Um, but I 100% respect and honor that. Like, you have to. I mean, because if those get leaked, every news company is going to splash that picture up. Just imagine the horror of those girls. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it just can't happen. It needs to be dealt with through a legitimate channel. Unfortunately, they're all blocked with sewage. Going forward, this case has highlighted the need for a national coordinated response to missing persons to ensure the best resources, technical equipment, and expertise are de deployed early for a SIP resolution. Specialist underwater search is under-resourced in the UK, and there's a lack of expertise county by county. The report recognizes the requirement for police dive teams to actively accept assistance from commercial partners who have advanced technology and equipment to locate missing persons. There are several statements in the report which do not reflect the actual events. On page 100, it states that a non-disclosure agreement NDA was signed by Peter Falding on the 6th of February. This is untrue. I never signed an NDA, nor was I ever asked to sign one or ever discussed. I only signed a form agreeing to being responsible for my own health and safety and risk assessments, but was not provided a copy of this, which I said earlier. I take confidentiality very seriously and would never breach an NDA or disclose any confidential or protectively marked material. The only instructions I was given to use discretion and keep operational information confidential. I was never given any operational information and never disclosed any location of significant target. If it, And I dug through absolutely everything and I watched every one of his interview 10 times over and there was never even a hint of this at all, zero from any source, zero. If at any time I was asked to stop updating the media, I would have a immediately but no request was ever made on page 101 it states that the silver commander an unnamed chief inspector was directed to meet with me and discuss the handling of the press and that this duty was discharged i do not remember this ever occurring I never met the silver commander or any other senior officers throughout my deployment i would always comply with any instruction given to me at no time was i ever briefed or advised specifically not to speak to the media failings by the police to control the media left me in a situation where i was swarmed for information on page 101 and 102, it states, I requested a photo opportunity to take place at the sea with a member of the chief officer team, the family, and myself. This is a gross misrepresentation of the facts, and then I could already tell just by reading it. I never requested a photo opportunity, but advised police that a media statement needed to be put out, which was supported by Paul Ansel, who was also pleading with police to widen the search to the local area, including the outbuildings in the village. Well, he wanted you away from that area, too. On page 29, it states that searches continued with SGI on the 8th and 9th of February by licensed search officers supported by SGI. This is not true. SGI left the scene on the 8th of February. SGI has been utilized by the police on many high-profile search operations for many years and have located evidence in human remains. SGI are highly regarded and not simply a commercial diving company as described throughout the report. SGI have more technologically advanced equipment and expertise in this field. The report says we have the same equipment as the dive team, which is untrue. The SGI sonar 1800 hertz is the highest frequency available. If you look at his Facebook, like the images he has, it's insane how crystal clear they are. Thank you. I would like to say thank you to everyone who has supported myself and my fantastic thing, team throughout this time. Never doubting our credentials and abilities, Specialist Group International continue to be available to help families who have lost loved ones, working closely with police, emergency services, and volunteer teams across the UK. I will make no further comment. All right, here we are. This is going to be my last piece here. This is going to be my theories and kind of drawing conclusions from what I think we can. Um, everything is my sole opinion, all right? So, and it's based off the context of if, that is Nicola Bully, in the finding of target location by Mr. Falding, then I think it's fair to say that this narrative, the Lancashire Constabulary, is holding as exemplary and the best of policing. Um, working hypothesis was true all along. It was an accident, right? Um, it's false. And I'll explain why. And it's not just because the 2 7, February 7th finding, okay? He first says that it took human form, then he did further enhancements and has live sonar data. Okay, those further enhancements, he goes from human form to she's lying on her right side in a fetal position, which means her back will be laying towards the center 
and her arms and legs towards the bank, okay? So he's able to get a clearer picture, okay? They refused him to dive, so I think that's important, but also the selective omission and deliberate disregard of Falding's evidence, okay, is very important here too, okay? Remember, they tell you in the IER, they never really intended for him to really have a role, right? He wasn't suggested, nor did they request, okay? It was simply to appease the public, right? He asked to dive twice, was refused. College of Policing interview, they only really cared about his media stuff so they could slander him. He wanted to extend and have further meetings so he could share all of his evidence. They weren't interested. He messages the coroner as soon as possible, I'd like to meet up to show with you what I have doesn't get acknowledgement or a response. Lancashire Constabulary was completely cold shoulder all throughout, right? Never met Becky Smith, okay? He thought he was going to be able to attend inquest, and as he says, bring up the target identification, which he should. It's about truth and transparency for Nicola. Completely railroaded and not allowed to go, right? Then he gets the College of Policing interview, and they want him to sign an NDA. For what? Right? So it's all of that together that I think gives credibility to this finding here. Okay? Also, as he points out very clearly in his response, which is very important, the diver who had 100%, I've never dived something that 100% visibility, they originally said negative nothing there. And in the independent external review, they say there was tree branches. So it's almost as if they're willing to concede that something may be there. If you see something in Faldings, that's what it was. It was the tree branches. As Falding, as Falding points out, since when did it become tree branches? It's always been nothing. So you can see their little snaky stuff going on, right? So it's all of that compiled together. And then when you get to the presser, the College of Policing Chief Executive. As far as I'm aware that he's no longer on the list like completely railroading him. They want you to completely discredit his career and name and then therefore whatever he has is moot. Why don't they confront the evidence directly? Why don't they allow him to dive? Why don't they let him and they go to these experts in in these academic experts and they only give him the initial photo that was the human form. They're not giving him the live sonar data or even giving Falling the opportunity to show what he sees, right? Or the laying on the right side in fetal position. That's all I'm advocating for is why can he be a part of the process because he was involved in the search investigation of Nicola. He found a important identification that he was refused to dive. And now they're squandering and squirtling away you know, they even say in the presser, Snowden, Snowden, it's definitely determined that she couldn't have been found sooner. Why are you even saying that if it's not even a legitimate probability? You know what I'm saying? Like they're worried about something, okay? So if that's Nicola, then there's a major problem with the narrative they've been trying to hold all along, okay? And I'm going to show you something here in forensic research that I've done. In forensic terms, there's nothing whatsoever deemed classic about any drowning. Remember at the inquest that one guy says there's signs indicative of a classic drowning? <laughs> forensic terms, nothing whatsoever deemed classic about any drowning. No one particular physical characteristic manifesting in a corpse that would aid in expediting such a ruling. Because of this, the methodology for reaching a determination that it is a water death and accidental is one that is chiefly focused on excluding foul play. They never did that. Remember, they were always taking the benefit of the doubt from Paul, the vulnerabilities, the incident, right? This places a great deal of importance on the initial investigative role of police personnel who could inform or misinform a medical examiner with their onset reports and early conclusions. Even the autopsy is insufficient on its own for definitively pinpointing the victim's cause of death as an accidental drowning. But line of inquiry a medical examiner follows during this phase of the inquest is to review the circumstances of how the deceased person reportedly first entered the water and try to judge if the body their viewing matches to that version of events. Everyone, the Lancashire Constabulary, don't even have a concrete version of events because they don't know. And they want to 
get mad at Falding because he suggested there's no signs of slipping. There's not. There's not. I'll take it one further. Research here. In general, the scene, this is in regards to scene investigations, okay? In general, the scene should always be a priori, considered suspicious, no matter how benign the initial presentation. This is particularly true when the reporting person or persons are the only individual to have seen the victim in the water, right? Or if there's not a witness, the last person, you know, to give the accounts. Simply attempting to fit circumstances in a solo witness or person to last of their events, report to an accidental drowning, creates tunnel vision, which leads to biased investigations. Each party involved in the investigation, law enforcement and a medical, medical legal examiner, should not rely exclusively on each other to suggest any suspicious findings in order to continue or perform a more specific investigation. First responders must document and immediately report to the competent authority inconsistencies between reports of witnesses, which there is inconsistencies all over the place. With Penny, right, there's screams being heard. Paul can't get his gym short bit straight, right? Um, yeah, I was just always going to talk about with that. Just the operation is not exemplary and or no way can be determined to represent the best of policing. There's no way. And then we talk about, you know, high risk missing persons case. They slap on a 20 plus year SIO specializing in covert policing outside the eyes of public. Okay. Who doesn't apparently think anything suspicious whatsoever. The two fishermen, not suspicious to me. Okay. She tells you that both the cameras were working at Rowan Waters and they weren't. This one over here wasn't. We had someone from there confirm that, okay? No, that one's off and the caravan's off just, just so conveniently. Not to mention the lady in red's caught on CCTV. The lady in yellow with the proms caught on CCTV. Nicola's nowhere. The photo of her leaving her house is not her, okay? I think it's Emma White, backed up by the behavior of her concealing her ring intentionally after that date, okay? Also matched with the fact that in the photo that is Nicola, that they try to mesh together with it, this illusion, they shave her nose off, okay, to make so you can't compare noses. If you look at the photo, the calf sizes aren't the same, right? I know you guys think I'm repeating myself, but I have to, okay? Was Nicola there at all that morning? They say she was seen at the school. That was Emma. It doesn't count, okay? Nothing matches up. Then we have the strange man in black standing at the end of allotment lane, at inquest, referenced as strange by Mr. Fife. Now we have Mr. Falding coming out and saying, on the day he located the target location, there was a man in black on the bank who was asking peculiar questions related to the sonar capabilities and capacities. So much so that him and his team had a media personnel snap a picture. This could be something, you know. That wasn't even his focus, but it was odd enough it caught his attention, just like the guy who caught Fife's. Okay, just like the two men who were scouting the day before the incident happened by the garage man, you know, over by the bridge, right, which took Lancashire Constabulary 14 days to follow up on, okay? So Becky and her little corrupt, covert ninjas aren't suspicious, and I'm not saying they're hers. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. But who are these men in black, right? Now... I mentioned Iwalina Sasaka earlier, right? She said she was being followed, okay? Then you have Michael Brooks. They get to the trial and Witness X backs up and doesn't want to testify. Why? Because of fear? You hear Nicholas looking into this Derek guy. There's 23s associated, okay? I'm not saying these are all connected. I'm not. But it's awfully nefarious that you have this dark cloud of weird circumstances involving situations where the coroner and the police are all too quick to deem cell fate nothing suspicious to see here and nothing adds up right and they seemingly have immunity within the constabulary and the coroner's on up for the college of policing seems like some criminal syndicate type of thing right and i'm not saying it applies to this case but it's interesting it's very interesting okay we don't have this type of corruption that's this clear-faced in the U.S. I'm not used to it. Like, I'm not used to as 
Like this case for me was so clear to see. Every pe- presser was a bomb. Becky, Lawson, Riley, Marsh, Snowden. Every time he takes the mic, with all due respect, he just doesn't cut it, right? I mean, it's, it, I just don't understand. But see, that's the thing when you're not telling the truth. It's it, it's hard to maintain that line. Okay, I'm getting off track. Um. So we have, and then. You have the phone conveniently sent on the bench. A little while down, the floor is the lead. So as if you're just, just, just oh, oh, and Becky, she even holds her phone out in front of her like they're trying to sell this one, two, what comes next to everybody. And they're expecting everybody in unison to go three. Like that. that's what they're doing. Right? I mean, it's, ugh. So the thing with, with folding here, okay, it's not just his work to go on and move from the human form to the laying on her right side to the sonar data but it's also reinforced by his attempts in denial not only to dive but to be involved throughout the process for truth and transparency into the search and investigation of nicola bully something's not right it's very clear it's very clear okay now i want to get into the specifics here of why um on that date what was going on so when peter raised that initial idea of her being there okay i believe through his further study um and his willingness and courage to come out his conviction in this right and like i said backed up with the selective omission only reinforces it right there's only two things that can be going on here the police are completely incompetent they did dive it three times are blind as a bat and just didn't see it or they didn't find her and they honestly came back to the server nope don't do anything like like that's literally an option okay they just didn't and they honestly believe nothing's there okay you gotta maybe that's the case but i don't think it's that or they're aware she's there and they know that which I think is backed up by the refusal to let an independent party dive. You know, they move from nothing to now there's trees. As almost if, if anybody sees faulting stuff and they think something's there, we got to prop something up there in place so that they can be like, oh, maybe it's the tree. That's exactly what that is. I love that faulting pointed that out. It's beautiful. Um, now, a lot of people, and you know, this isn't a novel. You're sitting here thinking, well, why would the police do that? Right? I, I understand that. Um, I think there's two reasons for that. I think you can either say, so let me back up. The night before Nicola went missing, there was a council or whatever you guys call it, community team meeting on record that I don't have permission to share or I would. Um, I haven't asked, but they had a $200,000 domestic violence related fund that had not been spent. And the guy says at the end, well, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. So how does that relate? Keeping her underwater for 11 more days allows them to go out to the bay and spend those 11 days. And as you'll see, searching the caravan park and doing all these extra activities. And if they know she's there, they're not really actually spending all that money they're budgeting on the actual paper. Okay, they're, they're, they're funneling and laundering it. And why? Because if you don't spend it, you lose it. That's why. It's money laundering 101, right? Or, and or, I guess I should say, it's to allow for further decomposition to settle in, right? They had to identify her by dental records, which would be related to to wither away the cause of death, right? It could be one or both of those. Um, but for them in that instance to intentionally continue to try to conceal it, um... I think is related to money because they have this big facade of all this effort they're doing, but they're not actually expending all that money they say they're doing, right? And so they're they're funneling it in some way for, I don't know, these men in black or drugs or weapons or trafficking or something's going on. Something's going on. Um, or it's to allow for further decomposition to settle in to wither away the cause of death, okay? 
that's my opinion as to why you would do that okay now i know um falding and a lot of people are under the interpretation that holy cow she was there wow you know then she eventually raised like he says under the cover of darkness on a winter's evening crested the weir okay because the water levels rose and i'll show you i went over this before they didn't rise until like the 21st because the full moon didn't hit till that wednesday she was found on sunday the water levels went up a third of a foot it's like 1.3 feet to 1.63 feet i'll show you the measurements on the screen that's it okay so in my opinion i don't think that's enough to cause her to rise up and over, right? Number one. Number two, the rocks after the weir, I just don't see her not getting snug, snug up on those, right? I'm not saying it's impossible because it definitely is, right? Um, but then also you have these embankments, right? That she could get stuck on. And most importantly, the bridge has two arches on either side, a massive embankment island in the center, okay? So not only does she have to crest the weir after she rises, okay? She has to get over these shallow rocks, not get dragged into all this stuff. And remember, this is all going to be under the cover of darkness because if it's during the day, somebody's going to see it, right? Because everybody's supposedly looking. Falding saw her on the 7th, right? She's going to have to go through one of those without being hung up on that embankment. Then she's going to have to snake her way through all this without being seen with everybody's eyes there. Okay, all the way up to where she was eventually found. But remember, she didn't just go here because we know the guy who found her, Jason Rothwell, a psychic, saw her coming down this way where she eventually laid to rest up here in the reeds, which I went over Marsh Farm Tidal Flow. Um, it goes on a pendulum, okay? For her to be coming back this way, meaning she already went to the extent of the pendulum this way when the water was sucking back out, went to her furthest extent, wherever that may be. This is Marsh Farm Hall, okay? I determined like right here, it could be up here, wherever you can't really know for sure. But then as it starts to move back in every 12 hours, she would be making her way out, okay? So when she was located and found, was right here on her way back. Nobody else saw her. And I have a comment on that too, which I'll come back to, okay? So I'm not saying it's not possible. It could be. But here's my thing. This is going to be mind-blowing here, I think. If Nicola's there and the police know that, and they're just not completely inept, right? And that's why they didn't allow Peter to die there. That's why they're selectively omitting his involvement throughout this entire process. Okay? They're doing it intentionally, right? If it was about recovery, they would have brought her up. So I'm telling you, it's either money expenditure or it's to allow for further decomposition to set in, okay? Now, with that said, as Falding says himself, there is no science to back up the invariabilities of when someone will rise because it connects to water temperature, body weight, clothing, um, debris. There's all different, all different sorts of variables that go into it. However, science does show and back that at a certain point in the decomposition process, body will fill up with gases and they will float and come to the surface. That's not a matter of maybe, nope, that's black and white, okay? So at some point after drowning, you go to the bottom. Depending on all the other variables, there's no way to determine when, day seven, day nine, day three, there's no way to know because of all the variables. But you do know at some point she will raise, right? I hope you're following me. So what I'm saying with that point is if they are not going to let Peter Falding dive here because she's there and they know it, they're not going to allow the invariabilities of her possibly popping up the next day or in three days to happen. Why? 
because they're control freaks. If they're going to conceal and control who can dive there, what that is, what's not there, right? They're not going to let to roll the dice on the natural biological process of her maybe popping up in two days. If, why? Because it, then, it, then why the hell are they not just recovering her when Falding pointed her out? You see what I'm saying? So what I'm get, my point I'm getting to is, is they would have intentionally weighed her down or kept her from coming afloat. And I come to that point because if she's there and they're not letting Falding dive, okay, they're also not going to let her float. Because let's say they plan to do it 23 days, but oh shit, Falding found her, now we have to fall in line. Yep, we found her, great job, okay, move on. You would think that's what they'd do. They're not, which I think it's more related to cause of death, right? Definitely money laundering too, but they're not going to allow the invariabilities of natural biological processes, not really knowing for certain, you know, when she pops up. Remember that 23 is important. You know, Becky, Jason, I'm not saying that applies here, but it's awfully suspicious, right? Um, They would have weighed her down. I would be curious, and I shouldn't even say this, I would be curious if there's any type of blanketing, you know, small tarp that's been able, that would have been removed. Um, or weighting down in her ankles, okay? If I haven't lost you already and you don't think I completely lost my marbles, what connects the dots here for me? As soon as I heard this location and observed Lancashire Constabulary completely downplay its significance, it reminded me of back in, was it May, June? I had three separate people email me, three, who had private conversations with Mr. Roswell himself, Okay. Mr. Rothwell, in multiple occasions, has stated his first observation of Nicola Bully was she was floating upright. I've never shared it before. I remember the first time I heard it, I sat back and there's one family member I talked to and I kind of spin thoughts up with this stuff and I'm like, Cause that's the tidal section of the river that defies gravity you know, she's deceased. The buoyancy just doesn't add up. doesn't make any sense. Physics. The only way that you're bobbing like a buoy upright in tidal flowing river water when you're deceased and your body has that tendency to float face down given the process of where you're at in decomposition is if you're weighted down at the feet. And likewise, if your feet are sticking out of the top, then you got something around your neck or your head, right? But he said she was floating upright. Okay, now people are like, whoa, how would she move? I'm saying that if they knew she was here, they would not allow her to be recovered. They're also not going to allow the invariabilities and indetermination of not knowing when she could potentially come up to just happen naturally. They're going to control that because they're controlling everything else in this stage. Okay? Now, the problem is, is once Falding pointed that out, they're like, oh, shit, we can't let her go there because if she pops up in a week or we let her go in two weeks, he's going to come back and say, see, I knew that target was right. And that would have been before inquest and they would have been screwed because everybody in the public would have been back in him and back at that point. But now they're to the point they're in the final review process. You hear Snowden say, and therefore this is considered a learning process. They're trying to close that cover of that book, the end, right? They couldn't leave her here. So what do they do? Well, everybody, This is where we get the infamous Marsh Farm Hall pressers to shift attention away from the river wire. They start to search the caravan park and the Grapes Pub and oh my lord, this is where Becky comes out a day after those interviews and drops the vulnerabilities. Nothing to see here, folks. Just a menopausal woman struggling with drinking issues. To take everything away from the river so that she could be moved. In my opinion. Okay? To back that up even further, the fact that she was caught in these reeds, okay? I've explained this in great detail before. You don't go all the way out 
and she never would because it goes on a 12 hour pendulum okay and it's too far of a distance to go all the way out to the Fleetwood right and I'll put those um, water measurements up here it only variated like I said between the 1.3 feet and 1.63 feet yeah on Wednesday the full moon would have come in okay and then the tide would have raised and you could predict I guess the water inflow if she was lodged in somewhere then she could have popped out okay but the fact that she was caught right here as I suggested earlier, she was on her way back, okay? She couldn't have been penduluming back here and forth for days. She couldn't have been. She would have been caught in here. There's no way she coincidentally went past this multiple times and didn't get caught and also wasn't seen, okay? So, could she have went over the weir? Maybe, but then she's going to have to go over the weir with very nominal water rays a third of a foot she's gonna have to go over those rocks which i don't think she would have gotten past the rocks if she went over the weir okay then she has to go through this fork in the bridge with the massive embankment in the center that just, i mean you're just there's no way it's like rolling snake eyes five times in a row and then she's got to snake through all this not get hung up right coming all the way back here and the fact she's floating upright, here's the deal. Remember, she was missing a shoe. So if you want someone to become visible who was previously weighted down, would it not help to remove maybe one leg so they become a little bit more buoyant? Is that where the shoe comes from? On the ledge over by where Curtis is walking at that one point? Right in that area wherever it was recovered? Because I'll tell you what, I've spent a lot of time the last three days watching that recovery footage. I'm not going to say very much because I don't, I mean, that's privacy for the girls and the grandparents. But there's a reason why Curtis got nailed for that. There is things in that recovery video that they can't answer to. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, and when Jason says how I found her in that, the way she was in the water when I found her, okay, no, I'm not saying this is the truth. I'm theorizing. I've never shared this before because I didn't make much sense, but I'm going off of the logic that if that's her, I'm trusting the enhancement photos, Falding's experience, right? Also, their control narrative fixation. That if they're not going to let him dive, if they were going to jump off board and okay, we got we got to um, we got to abort the mission or we got to eject. Oh, yep, yep, he found him. Yep, we got him. They would have done it then. But the fact that they held strong with their conviction, right, tells me that if that is Nicola. They're not going to, in turn, allow her to just flow up, given all the invariabilities as to when you're not going to really know when she pops up, okay? And number two, you ain't going to let her pop up there, because if she doesn't crest the weir, because the water doesn't raise for another two and a half, three weeks, she's going to be stopped right here, which is going to bring Falding out with his evidence before the inquest, and they can't have that. They had to move her, which is why you have the Marsh Farm Hall interviews, with Paul and ironically that's when Paul sits on the couch and he says you ever feel like you're in the Truman Show the Truman Show the Truman Show is a man who lives in a world where everything is being controlled by the government and the people around him and he has no say he's just walking the walk and doing whatever he needs to they control everything I said before that he was alluding to something there and that's exactly what I'm saying okay they shift to the caravan park they shift to the, the grapes pub right and then the vulnerabilities are dropped on the 15th, right? To hopefully lose all speculation, okay? Like Falding says, he usually gets that information. He never got it because I don't think they had that plan yet. That was kind of their, after the 7th, they had to figure something out. They had to figure something out on what they were going to do. And that's what I think that's a response towards. I still think she was moving. Now, how? I don't know. 
Okay, I, I again, I don't know all the facts. I, I live thousands of miles away from there. Um, but I'm just going off of logic. If that's her, they knew it was her. They lied. There was nothing there. Now there's trees. They're also going to make sure that she doesn't pop up because they can't control that. So what do you do to counter that? You weigh her down. But the problem is, is you can't let her pop up there. Because if she does, Falding's coming out, and that's before inquest. So you have to move her. You have the Marsh Farm Hall interviews. I feel like I'm on the Truman Show. And you have Becky drop the vulnerabilities. Then, of course, can't forget, you have the chief executive of the College of Policing, Mr. Marsh, calling the vulnerabilities drop, avoidable and unnecessary. However, on the flip side, you have the, chief, uh, the crime and police commissioner coming out and saying it was a well purposed with the right intent highly rationalized policing decision so maybe marsh isn't completely within the know-all right was it a well-purposed policing decision to shift the whole scheme and remember the evening of the vulnerability drop you have the infamous photo with chief constable crowley and snowden taking the smug selfie right then you go to the marsh farm hall interviews and in the Marsh Farm Hall interviews, you have Dan Walker being the interviewer. We know he was hit on his bike, like I discussed last episode. And he also had a very suspicious statement in the hospital afterwards, basically saying, I want nothing to do with it, right? Now, I'm not saying he knows anything, but was there some type of do si do musical chairs going on throughout that Marsh Farm Hall interview that he's aware of, right? And why do I say this? The vulnerability drop... And then the Marsh Farm Hall interviews were back-to-back -back nights, approximately eight to nine days after Falding was there. And if you are going to move her, right, to set her up to be found at a different location, when's the perfect time to do it? Okay, under the cover of darkness, yes. But also during a press conference featuring the SIO Becky Smith and also the Marsh Farm Hall interviews. Where's everybody's attention going to be during those two events, right? It's interesting. So then the obvious question becomes how and who? Um, one thing I want to note is this tree branch that was over here. You see the picture I have on the screen. It's interesting to note that there's a yellow ribbon tied upon it. So that tells you that at some point during Nicola's disappearance, that was standing upright, right? And then it was knocked over into the water, okay? So could this be something to where she was backed into and dumped you know the branch was put in the water as like a makeshift bar or set to make sure that she doesn't float past it even though there's a little bit of a squeak where you could but that way like for instance someone drops her off jason's on the other end oh i found her you get it right you stage the recovery and the find but it's interesting to note that what knocked that tree branch over it definitely wasn't the weather i do think jason finding her is absolutely critical there's various reasons for that. Number one, because he's not from town. He's there at a weird time. He says the moon is moving into Pisces, right? Which I'll cover that um, briefly because I've done it in the past. But he was contacted by a member of the family, which we can presume is Paul, right? Okay. So he coincidentally is the one who ends up finding her, right? He has a past with Becky and Paul. The drug bust that happened five to seven years ago, both in Ansel and Rothwell will bust it. Okay. So, um, also he's related to the Michael Brooks case where that individual was lost in a waterway despite police searching up and down for two weeks, was not able to be found. Jason was on a phone call with somebody and somehow his visions helped locate recovery, right? Or he had some intuition towards it, right? I think that's interesting, especially because that case has an awful ironic similarity with the men in black nefarious, right? The witness that refused to testify, okay? It's just weird that he's around these two black clouds around these missing people. I think it's more likely that he was tipped off, right, to go find her. And the crazy thing is, you know, he was contacted by Paul, right, to find her or to help find her. But then you also got to remember... Who contacted Peter Falding? <laughs> Emma and Paul. So it's ironic that the tar target location 
comes from Falding, who was contacted by Emma and Paul. And it's ironic that her body was eventually found on the 19th by somebody that was recruited by Paul. Tell me that's a coincidence? No, I don't think so. I think that's Paul keeping the police in check, almost like a blackmail type of thing, which I'll discuss later. Real briefly, okay. Now, in regards to could she have crested the weir, made all the way in on her way back, all right? So... As Peter mentions, there's an uptick in the 22 cubic meter flow, right? It did rise. I will put the water tidal measures on here, which come from the Fleetwood tidal area, okay? Yeah, the Fleetwood measurements are coming right here. I just want to make it a point because these are coming in at a foot, two and a half foot. You have to correspond the measurement rays with what's ever here. So if it's two and a half foot here, six and a half here, goes to seven and a half foot, goes to one to two feet here. You get the point, right? I just don't want anybody saying it's not that shallow there. But the point is, the water levels in those first two weeks were relatively static. You can see 0 0.36, 0 0.40, it doesn't really waver, right? Then all of a sudden on the 17th, 18th, 19th, I have it in orange, red, then orange. You can see it goes to 0 0.50, 0 0.75, 0 0.50. What does that mean, okay? It was static for two weeks. It goes from 50 to 75 to five, okay? So you can suggest, per the Fleetwood measurements, it went from about 1.3 feet all the way up to 2.5 feet. So overall, the water rose about a foot. The influx of water rose about a foot. Now, not the complete rise that would happen later the next week, midweek, with the full moon, but you can see the swell starting to pick up, which I think is a direct correlation to the flow being faster, as Falding says, 22 cubic meters, right? So is this what caused Nicola to be dislodged from wherever she may have been, right? Um, hiding out of plain sight, you know, to cause her to then come down and float, float down this way, right? Could be. I don't think so, okay? Also what that point made, if you look at the measurements, if she was here at the target location that Peter had identified, okay, she wouldn't have been able to crest that weir until the evening of the 17th or 18th. And then she would have had to make her way all the way up and back within that day or two, okay? Um, which was the following weekend after the Marsh Farm Hall interviews and the vulnerability drop, okay? So three, four days after that, right? But I think it's important to mention because it's not like they don't raise it. They raise a little bit. But as Marsh and Snowden say, they predicted it. They predicted it. They had a team in place. They just weren't there yet. They had a team in place for the next week because it would only continue to go up, right? But coincidentally, you have Jason Rothwell come in and preempt that, right? Just get a little bit ahead of it. Who was recruited by Paul? Okay, and I think that's by design because you're not going to want to have an entire police team come out and recover her because chances are they're not a part of all, all of them are not a part of the operation. They don't all have the playbook that the upper escalon hierarchy is in on. Okay, so they say they predicted it and they plan to go and do it, but then you just preempt it a little bit, which is where you get the moon was moving into Pisces, I was led to her. Dude, you're from out of town, Paul requested you, and you just so happened to be walking all the way out here on the 19th as if you knew she went missing here, she has to be in and around here. I, I just don't buy it. Now, could this have been what could have, you know, dislodged or broke Nicola free from wherever she may have been hidden from plain sight, you not being able to be found somewhere within this pendulum before? Potentially right but i don't think so okay why because the first two weeks the water level remains static about 0 0.36 0 0.40 0 0.41 0 0.43 you can see in the thing here it doesn't really move until the 17th and on the 17th it only rises to 0 0.50 so not even that far it's not until the 18th where it goes up to 0.75 and then back down so that's really the only bend in the trend Okay, the, the real big shift. It's not even that big. Again, later in the week with the full moon, it would have been almost double that. Okay, so could this have been what dislodged her and allowed her to be able to be seen? Could have been, right? Leading her to float along and her being spotted by Rothwell on that morning. And as the police are suggesting, we were anticipating the flow to come in. He just beat us to it. 
I guess in the realm of possibility, it could happen. Um, it reminds me of a clip that comes to mind from when I was a kid. It could happen. Yeah. Now again, I'm not saying it is not possible she didn't cross that weir. She could have, but then you have to agree and accept such all happened outside the eyes of the public. Over the weir, skip the rocks, split the fork in the bridge, missing all the shadows and embankments, not being tied or hung up at all. Not to mention how tight and thin some of the straits are and how many winds and turns there are throughout this entire journey. Outside the eyes of the public, Nicola, on the eve of most likely the 18th because of the water levels raising approximately a foot. She traveled, okay? This is what we have to agree and accept. If she did raise from this location, the target location identified by Peter Falding, and that was her, this, day, this distance where she was found was less than a mile as the crow flies, okay? It was like 0.88. But if we follow the winding path of the water, which is the only way she could have went, and the fact that she was observed coming back this way suggests that she had been to a considerable distance this way. If you understand the tidal flow, okay, it goes on a 12-hour pendulum. Her coming back this way means that she would have reached her extent this way. Is it the tree brush that was set there? Could have been. Which then that suggests that she was set in there a lot sooner because she also got snug up on tree brush here. Okay, she wouldn't have been swinging back and forth between here and here and not getting snug. If she's dropped in where the branch is, she's gonna go and then she's found. Almost as if, hey Jason, we're dropping the target, be ready. You know, I'm not saying that's what the case is, but it could be, okay? You back him with the truck, you dump her, happens to knock the tree branch over. That's an option. But, as the crow flies, less than a mile. But if you follow the winding here all the way up to where she would most likely go, tree branch it's like 3900 meters if you go all the way up to around this area it's like 4100 meters two and a half miles she would had to have went outside the eyes of the public if she simply rose under the cover of darkness skipped all these obstacles was not seen okay she would have had to have gone 4100 meters or 3900 if we consider the tree branch she was stopped and then came back okay she didn't get stuck 4,100 meters, not being seen. Jason finds her on the morning of the 19th. Right. What I am saying is that such is an awfully ironic stroke of coincidence considering all the circumstances, especially with the revelation of Falding's accounts. The mere timing of the out-of-town psychic contacted by Paul just so happened to be able to stumble upon her approximately as the crow flies a mile down from the bench. I just don't buy it right and if he's what he's saying is true she was floating upright that almost suggests that she was being weighted down and if she was weighted down there's no way in hell she doesn't get snug up on one of these things because if she did rise natural decomposition she would have been floating most likely face down all the way through but if it is true that he saw her floating upright that blows all of that out of the water now going back to the february 7th target identification by Mr. Falding. I found these pictures on one of the early newscasts that actually shows the SGI team around said area of interest, okay? Um, I didn't recognize it then, and I don't think anybody else really caught onto it either, right? Um, and they did a good job of deterring attention away. So you see that now and you're like, but then he went and did a press conference and he didn't even allude to it. And how are the police upset with him? He maintained the integrity of the investigation. How could you argue that he didn't? I just have a really hard time believing that sometime after the 7th, when Falding was identified the location, which would have been, given the levels for her in order to crest that weir, would have had to have been the 17th or 18th if she did do it that way. If this is what happened, completely outside the eyes of the public, crested the weir, skipped the rocks, dodged the embankment and fork in the bridge, snaked all the tight and narrow straits, not being hung up on anything throughout, traveling 4,100 meters, two and a half miles, floating face down, if she was not weighted. But, like I had mentioned, if what Jason is saying is true, she was floating upright, then I'd bet she was weighted down when Falding located her too. That's the most likely scenario to me. 
right? And she was moved under the cover of a ruse, the Marsh Farm Hall interviews, well rationalized, policing decision, vulnerabilities presser, shifting focus away from the river. Another note I want to make on the Marsh Farm Hall interviews. When Folding is interacting with Paul and Emma towards the end of the bank, then we learn at the independent external review, he informed and distressed the family when he told them about the target location. Look at Paul and Emma's emotion. They're nonverbals. I would contend, sure, cause distress because their plan was unfolding. Look at that photo. What emotion comes to mind on your first impression? Definitely, to me, not concern or worry. Is that our dear, beloved Nicola? More like, oh shit. Now, I'm not saying Paul should have dove in there after her. No, I mean... If it was my partner, you bet your ass I'd be in there. But, you know, some would consider that crazy, okay? But I'm not saying that because he didn't do that. No, look at the man's face. Then look at this other photo, okay? Does that look like somebody that's worried, concerned, lost, hurt? To me, it looks calculated, nervous, masquerading. But that's besides the point. I certainly wouldn't wait eight days and then go sit on a couch, suggest that I feel a part of some Truman show, and applaud the police whom haven't considered any alternative from day one. In that very interview, you hear no acknowledgement of folding in his efforts. Yet you do have Paul confessing his respect to the Lancashire Constabulary, how good the relationship has been. We now know he, Paul, at that very time, was aware that Peter Falding located a potential target location. Yet here he is, eight days later, assisting every rock get turnt, the village be searched, I won't be satisfied until, applauding the police. And then we have two weeks before the independent external review drops, the covert SIO resigns and retires. And now the day after, Nicholas' house goes up for sale. Now, I can't assert that definitively means anything, but throughout my research and investing cases over the years, um, it's often the case that a suspicious spouse will tend to want to remove the kids and distance them from family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, you know, cousins. Why? Because as they get older, they begin to ask questions. Now, is Paul moving across the street from the grandparents and that blows that apart? I have no idea, okay? But if he moves a considerable distance away, I wouldn't be surprised. He does work online, what's holding him down, right? Or what's the argument going to be? Now that Nicola's not there, she was the breadwinner and now he can't afford the mortgage? Well, I guess that's a legitimate argument too, okay? But the day after the independent external reviews released... Uh, if he's just toying with people. I mean, I, that's just so odd. The fact that Becky's gone, now Paul's running, like, it's very peculiar, right? When you add everything up together. By itself, no, but everything considered together. Now, what does this all mean? What do I think in the grand scheme of things that's happened? Um, let me just share a couple scenarios that I think could be, right? Um... First things first, this case becomes awfully complex because you don't have a police-associated entity involved that you feel like you can really trust, right? That's the saddest part about the whole thing, okay? Um, and it's not me being all conspiratorial. I think if you followed me all along, I've been saying that forever, and I think the news that's come out has only validated that. Right. I'm going to go over a couple scenarios here. I think number one, let's suggest that she was alive that morning. Okay. That she took the girls to school. She walked along the towpath. She was the one who was texting her boss, setting up the play date. Right. Okay. I don't think this is the case, but we've got to be fair and transparent and consider all, all angles. Okay. If this was the case, then I don't think she elected self-fate in any scenario whatsoever, right? Dad said she appeared happy. She's got two girls. I just, I just don't think that's the case, okay? And I don't think all this diversion would be going on if nobody was involved, right? 
Um, so I think that if she was there that day, which I don't think she was, then you likely have to consider the man in black. Okay, the men in black. The two that were cited by the garage man in the days leading up to that were staking out the scene. Okay, it took Langer Shook and Stabley forever to get back and follow up on that lead. Becky doesn't find any suspicious. You have one sitting at the end of allotment lane. Concern being raised at inquest by Mr. Fife. Okay, now you also have Mr. Falding saying that you have one asking peculiar questions related to the capacities of sonar while he was closing in on the target location. Okay, so you have one days leading up to during the supposed incident and then after as they were honing in on the location that's very odd okay so if she was pushed or salted or pushed in i think they definitely have to be involved with that type of scenario was it a hit was she looking too far into derek right that could be possible right now here's the problems with this aspect okay Emma's the only witness that saw her that morning at the school. Now, I know people say there's other, but I would love to see. Now, they don't shouldn't come out because they don't feel safe. But there's no actual valid proof that anybody else saw her. Okay? The lady in red that was seen at the end of allotment lane is on CCTV photo, walking the dog. The lady in yellow walking along the towpath, okay, um, was seen pushing the prom or pram, however you say that. All right, but yet there's no Nicola. Okay, so what? Those CCTV cameras just glitched out? Because they want you to believe that she walked that same very towpath where those two individual ladies are shot. Where's the photos of Nicola? The police had them. Why wouldn't they provide them? Because it's the most recent capture of the missing person. I think it's more of a staged event. That's why the Caravan Park CCTV was off, as well as the Rowan Waters one, okay? To make, bring her in, she was already deceased, make sure those are off, so that way those actors could not be seen, and they could deposit her body, so they could set this whole stage that it was an accident. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But I don't think there's a scenario where she was actually there, there that day, and she was pushed in, okay? Um, because Willow would have been with her, and Willow had no reactions whatsoever. Even the next day, I don't believe what Paul says, but when Penny came up upon Willow, Willow wasn't frantic, okay? I think, had Willow went in, and I show these pictures of Willow loves the water. If the dog, Willow, at all senses, his Nicola in that water distressed, that daughter would, that dog would be right in there behind her, even if it meant that the dog also went down. The dog would just go by instinct. The fact that the dog didn't, I don't think anything happened there that morning. And also, you go to the CCTV at the house, okay? That's Emma in that photo, all right? Now, they stitched in images of Nicola from a different date, okay? And I've showed this in my past videos. The timestamps are all different fonts and sizes. You can tell it's tethered and stitched and it's not a live feed from the same day. If you even look at the picture of Emma coming out of the house down the center by almost her left hand, you can tell there's kind of a warp, okay? But I'm not gonna get into that. Um, now, why am I bringing this up here? Let's say Nicola was here this day and the reason they didn't release a CCTV photo footage of Nicola where the lady in yellow was or the lady in red is because what Nicola was wearing doesn't match what they have on the CCTV of her leaving the house that day. Okay, so what'd they do? Emma staged to look like her coming out of the house that morning. They stitched in like Emma. She just happened to be wearing something different. Okay, there's no other excuse why the two CCTVs that were apparently working don't also capture Nicola that day. There's just, there's just no, there's just no explanation. Okay, now using, um, and the thing is with Becky, She's the covert policing SIO. She has specialist training in digital media analysis, which I think goes to the timestamps. Um, when I uncovered the thing with Emma in the ring, that's why Paul was directed to come out and drop the CCTV, or he did it himself, right? 
because I think Becky and her team are helping him cover up and stitch and sell the narrative that she was at the River Wire that day. And I'll get to why, okay? Because her team does the video stuff, the surveillance, the misleading. Remember Becky made the slip on the road and they went into the system and changed the name of it, right? And she can't ever get her facts straight. Now, this is what I think is the most likely option and actually the truth. In the independent external review, you can hear Snowden say missing from home investigation again. And every time I hear it, I hit on it, okay? Because I think that's the actual truth. The fact that they live in Inskip, this is St. Michael's, I know it's close, okay? But there's a big difference between the police labeling this a missing from home investigation and a missing mother of two went missing while walking her dog on the river wire. They're not even close. They're not even close. I think something happened prior to her that morning, you know, after her dad saw her, the kids were in bed, okay? Something happened to her then. Now, one thing I do know, want to note that could fit that she was there that day, I can't remember the name of it, but it's called Cadaveric Mortis, which says that if someone dies in a traumatic scenario, they're likely to go into rigor mortis when the body and muscles stiffen up in the state where they were last struggling. So if you consider she's in a, on her right side in a fetal position, it could mimic like a doggy paddle, right? That she was drowning, okay? Could make sense. But then there's also dry drowning. Like if you held someone's head in a toilet bowl, you would get the same rigor mortis, okay? I just wanna make that clear. Any type of drowning, dry water, head in a bowl, any type of forceful submersion, the individual victim is going to put their hands out to try to push their head out and their legs are going to be bent because they're going to be down, okay? You're going to get the same rigor mortis depiction in that dry drowning as you are real life drowning. I hope that makes sense. So I don't really think you can really tell anything off of that, right? But I think that something happened at home. Now, this is where I think, this is where it gets interesting, okay? I think that the previous vulnerabilities were set up by Paul at an earlier state, okay? Um, now, he may have took her life himself and then sold this narrative to everybody else she took her life. Calling Emma, okay? Right, the EMTs come, which I'll get into that. But letting leading Emma to believe that she had committed this, okay? Emma would be more likely to be in on the cover-up for the sake of the girl's perspective on what happened to their mother, okay? It'd be a lot easier to accept that there was a tragic accident versus mother intentionally didn't want to be here. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, this is where I think the incompetence of the police comes in, okay? Remember, they have that budget that they need to expend. I think that Paul could have gotten word about this somehow, saw it as an opportunity, staged a suicide, given her previous vulnerabilities, okay? And they have this agreement that instead of ruling it a suicide, we'll set this covert, outside the eyes of the public, high tactics, Becky Smith operation, St. Michael's on the river wire to create this entire ruse that she was walking her dog and setting her phone on the bench, dropping the lead. She fell in, must be an accident, okay? Emma stands in as Nicola that morning on the, on the footage, okay? Emma and the police believing it's suicide at that point, okay? Helping him, him cover all the digital stuff, right? having the caravan park which paul has family related there turned off Roman water turned off the man in black are helping becky in that type of syndicate okay remember willow heard that he was barking up here was there somebody involved here did she initially go in there and float i don't think so okay i think there was a distraction the guy at the end of allotment lane was looking out the red vans parked in and you have the tree cover all the way in to be able to bring in and deposit a body unscathed, which if you look at the place where she was target identified by Peter, comes right out there and almost straight down, okay? You have people watching out, it wouldn't be hard to be able to do, right? If she's wrapped in something that's weighted down, you're covered. That's it. Now, why would the police be in on this? Well, they bring Becky in, 
because it's not really a high risk missing persons case, but it's an opportunity to expend 23 days of all this budget, all these resources going out to the canal using this high tech equipment, right? Not allowing Peter to dive, doing all this stuff, allowing them to spend all this money that they're actually not spending because they know where she's at, right? And that's why they wouldn't let her be recovered because they had still more money to gather, okay? But also at the same time, what's the deal cut for Paul? It's allowed to be ruled on the death certification as an accident. He's able to claim life insurance. The daughters believe their mother had an accident as opposed to self-fate, okay? Emma probably believes that, okay? And they have this double-edged sword going on between Paul and the police, okay? But Paul starts to get a little bit worried that I think somewhere along in the investigation, the police may be starting to wonder whether or not this is as it appears or Paul projected it. Maybe it's not the vulnerabilities. Things aren't adding up. Catching on to his gym shorts bit, right? All these certain scenarios, right? So just to make sure that they don't turn on him and start to investigate a potential murder, he brings in and they request in Falding, okay? To kind of raise the scrutiny upon the police. It's not his problem. He doesn't have to deal with it right and then they he also brings in rothwell to find her okay because both those people are contacted by paul all right rothwell's a hint to becky just in case all right you don't flip why the police can't flip because they'd be in on the whole operation being a stage scene so that they could use resources which is the public's money to fake this search and investigation so they could pocket a budget why because if you don't use it you lose it so they can't go and turn on Paul because that will out their rigged operation, okay? And you should never do that in the name of somebody who just lost their life. You see what I'm saying? It would look so gross. Now, with that said, missing from home investigation, Snowden says it himself, okay? They stage this whole river wire thing with the help of the police, they deposit the body in the river so that their accident theory from day one will eventually fit because she's going to be found there eventually, right? Under their control, right? She's weighted down because they want to determine when. That's why they're not going to let Peter Falding dive, right? But here's the deal. The missing from home investigation. If they're willing to move a deceased body of Nicola into the river to stage this whole charades, why wouldn't they then also remove her and place her elsewhere they're both one and the same thing because some people are going to say well no she popped up and crested the weir i can't so here's the deal if they're willing to deposit the deceased body already in the water that's no different than recovering her and moving her again it's no different it's the same act you have to be just as evil and dirty to do either one or both right and like i said they're not going to let her pop up there because they couldn't determine the invariabilities of when she would raise. And everybody knows that every single day that she went missing, there was at least some people walking this. They would have seen her. The water didn't raise until the 18th. She wouldn't have popped until that night. And like I said, all the, all the stroke of luck she would have to hit to not be seen. And the fact that she was seen floating upright, okay? So I said, I think it's a double-edged sword. I think Paul and the police both have skin in the game. They may have believed that it was self-fate. Gave Paul the opportunity, ultimatum. Hey, we could rule this that. Or will you be willing to work with us? And then they're under this whole contractual agreement, high operative scheming, so they can make money. While in turn, he can also recover life insurance, right? Then it wasn't until later on they realized that maybe this isn't what he says it was. But at that point, they can't turn and go and nail him for homicide because they partook in the acts of staging this thing. You see what I'm saying? And I think the well-decoded policing decision search, you know, the, the vulnerabilities, the caravan park and the grapes, that's all to shift of tension away. It's all well orchestrated, right? I think the selection of Becky as the covert SIO was selected for her specialties to sell this narrative. And I think that you can pull out examples of this all throughout the narrative. I mean, it's all over the place. The surveillance, the high-end tech, the digital media, the fact that that video of her that day doesn't look anything like her. She's not spot on these CCTV photos. If she was there that day, we'd be getting CCTV of where the lady in red or the lady in yellow was. It's simple. 
The CCTV at the school was turned off. I mean, come on, people. Rowan Waters was turned off so whoever it was could get in and get out, right? It was all orchestrated. And I think ultimately that if they began to realize that Paul may have some dark motives actually behind this and it wasn't self eight, it was too late. They couldn't close. They couldn't turn it on him because it was too late because they were complicit in the moving, right? Now, could this be that, you know, Becky's a dark sorcerer, you know, and she's in on the murder? I mean, she could be, you know, it could be any number of things, but I'm trying to be rational here. And I think that to me, overall, what this comes across as is Becky and the police of the Lancashire Constabulary were signed in on something, hired her in as the covert secret police to help stage this narrative, and it wasn't as they originally depicted the truth to be until it was too late and they got stuck. Okay? And that's why Paul's in the perfect position right he's calling in peter calling in jason making sure to embarrass them a little bit and watching them make sure that they nope you know how becky's so trying to sell so hard and i keep saying they oversell they over over oversell oversell he's in the perfect position because they can't turn on him right but he wants to make sure that just so they know we had an agreement here and i don't think it's all of them i think it's a select few one or a couple right okay that's all I'm going to talk about with that now. Um, all of you that are still here, I really appreciate you. Um, this one took me a long time. I've been sick. I wanted this to come out like a week ago. I will be breaking this portion off into a second separate segment called If Slash and Then because there's a lot of people that may not click on this video given it's three hour length almost. And I think this stuff is at least important for people to ponder and consider, right? Um, my upcoming project that I've been working on for the last month and a half creating a video i've been working on the case for 18 months two years almost is on the delphi murders the tragic loss of abigail williams and liberty german and i was on the verge of releasing that however this news came out and nicholas case has been one of my commitments so um one that i didn't think anything would come up to my passion for the delphi case but once this case came out Man, I became really attached to it, got really into it, and it will forever be a priority of mine. So, um, yes, I will be coming out with that here soon, within the coming days, week. So look out for that, please. If you have not subscribed, um, please do that. Give the video a like. It helps in the algorithm. I wish everybody well. Let's keep everything positive, all right? Now, I know some people are going to say this is why Falding shouldn't have come out. It just creates all these conspiracy theories that... No, this has nothing to do with me taking what Falding said and running with it. I've always had these perceptions. That's merely just another Lego piece that I can help put into my overall picture that I've always had, right? I think everybody needs to maintain respect for the guy, right? Because he's doing good what should be done, right? Um... Yes, I hope everyone has a great holiday. It's good to be back. And until next time, mind juice out.